Good morning, everyone. I am going to call the strategic planning retreat for the City of Deltona City Commission to order at Saturday, May 15th, 2021. May we have the roll call, please? Present. Commissioner Here. Commissioner McCool. She is excused. Commissioner Ramos. Present. Commissioner Sosa. Here. Vice Mayor Bradford. Present. Mayor Herzberg. Here and now, may we please stand for the Pledge of Allegiance. Commissioner King, would you like to lead us? Okay, welcome commissioners. Welcome Mr. Marlowe. We have our city manager here and our city attorney. And you're up, sir. This is all you. Thank you. Good morning, everyone. Appreciate you uh, joining me today. Uh, with your permission, I'd like today to be informal if we could. Uh, and instead of titles, if we could just call by first names, I'm Herb. Uh, and uh, we'll do it that way. Uh, in the Navy and pilot training, one of the things, if you're trying to be a pilot, is you walk up uh, from chow or meals and it tests your peripheral vision. And if you can't see the thing, suddenly you're no longer in pilot training. So I need John and Marcia to know I can't really see them. <laughs> and if they need to say something, you need to yell Herb. <laughs> I'm not ignoring you, but, uh, you know, I, there's a reason I didn't get to fly. <laughs> so... Uh, uh, since we're being live streamed, I'd like to take a moment just to explain what we're doing so anybody watching uh, has a sense. This is a retreat, and a lot of cities across Florida and the nation do strategic planning retreats. And the purpose of a retreat is to really have an informal conversation uh, among ourselves. There's no formal decisions made here today, uh, but it's a chance for us to talk and you to talk to each other uh, in a fairly unstructured environment. Uh, so that, you know, for the things you want to bring up, you can. It's not like a formal meeting where we've got an agenda and you have to this item and this item. Uh, we, we do have a time frame we're working in. I have a number of things I'd like to talk with you about. Uh, but, you know, during the course of the day, if you have something you'd like to talk about, and if I, I'll write it on the board here if we need to hold it for a bit. Uh, but that's, that's the purpose of this. And this is, uh, you know, this is done across the state. It's fairly normal practice. Uh, so it really is just a conversation between us uh, together here today. Uh, my goal today is to walk out of here with a sense of what you want as goals for your city. We're not necessarily going to try to wordsmith them today, but I just want to understand you want a goal in this area. Next week, uh, I'll work with John and his staff to determine what I call strategies. And let me give an example. If the goal is, and I'm going to assume one for the moment, is economic diversification, well, there are various strategies to do that. You all happen to have a number you're working on, logistics, healthcare, ecotourism. And then below those strategies are what I call objectives. These are specific tasks you want to get done. Like your ecotourism plan has a, a, some objectives about some buildings on the lake. Uh, that gets full, those objectives are what really comprise your budget. And so you ultimately approve the strategic plan when you approve the budget. And so working with John, we'll have a set of objectives. On May 24th, I believe, is the date we'll come back and present that. Uh, and obviously, you know, y'all can approve, change, whatever. You know, we'll do whatever we need to do to make sure it's consistent with where you want to take the city. Uh, and then I worked with John on the 26th with staff to assign the ob objectives and all. And then he will bring that back to you in the terms of the budget is where you'll finally see it. So that's the process and how it works. Any questions about that before we, before we start? Okay. Boy, I'm clear as mud this morning, aren't I? Okay, very good. Uh, what I'd like to do is I'd like to begin with the positioning statement uh, and just sort of work through that. We'll take a break around 10. Uh, but one of, the, one of my assumptions from the conversation with you and every, all the people I've talked to in this community is that what I call economic diversification is very important to this community. By diversification, I mean jobs, I mean retail, jobs coming into the city, people being able to stay in the city to work, uh, dining, et cetera. Uh, and I, my hypothesis is there's really broad support for that in the community. Am I correct? Am I misreading the community? Just talk to me about that, if you would. And just anybody, please. Yeah, I, I, I agree. Most people that I talk to 
would prefer to work in the city. They prefer to dine within the city limits. Most folks have to leave the city to either work or to eat. Or So most of the folks I've talked to would rather stay within the city and work and eat. Yeah. Okay. All right. Good. Well, what I found, though, is what the hard part for everybody to understand is they assume, I don't know if that's the correct word, that the city owns all the land and that we're the ones bringing in the restaurant. We're the ones to put that building there and why haven't you brought this restaurant and why haven't you brought this and what? And when we try to explain to them that these are private landowners, mm -hmm. you know, you've, it, we don't have the right to build on somebody's land. Sure. You know, we're not, a city's not responsible to build those buildings. We gotta get them in mm -hmm. to do that. And so, you know, uh, it, it's difficult because they they look at us like you're not doing your job. Uh -huh. Where's my restaurants? Where's my shopping? We have to go to Orange City. We have to go to Deland. And when we try to explain, well, we don't have the right to build that. Somebody owns that land. You know, I think one of our most my most common, as I know, is well, we've had this movie theater and there's nothing around it. We don't own that land. Mm -hmm. I don't have the right to go say, sure. Mr. Restaurant, come build here. That's a private landowner. And so, private businesses. And have a private, to decide whether right. It's so that's, it's almost as an education okay. as well to try to explain to them, this is, this is not a commission's decision to force something on a private landowner. Okay. Um, yes, um, I just wanted to piggyback on that because uh, the vice mayor brings up a good point, and you know you bring up a good point. But economic diversification has two facets to it for me. The one facet is what Anita talked about when you, you know, and what and what David talked about trying to be first names. <laughs> so um, when you talk about bringing in restaurants and bringing in places to shop and bringing in that type of retail, service retail, and so forth, that's one factor. But when you also talk about the economy and economic development, there's another factor of jobs. The jobs that are associated with retail are tend to be the lower paying jobs. They tend to be a, you know, a, a minimum wage type or service industry job. The other side of that, that is as viability for your city, if your people wanna work here, and they wanna, wanna do the, the working and the shopping and the playing here, you have to have sustainable wages. You have to have a sustainable workforce. And that is, it's easy to say you're not bringing in business like a Carabas or you know, a Longhorn or, or you know, a, a TJ Maxx, but what you are looking at, the other side of that is that it's our job to try to make it as economically viable for solid, well-paying jobs, which we, I think, are doing through the medical industry, th through distribution and so forth, because the more people can have those jobs and live in the city, the more likelihood when you bring economic development in, they look at what your meet your wages are, or your trips during the day, all that, in order for a business to come in here. It's just demographics. It's not mom and pop to the degree anymore. And the higher your wages are with bringing in better businesses and higher wage jobs, the more likely you're gonna get to fill up that stuff around the theater and those other areas. And I think it comes down to education and understanding economic development. So one thing I'd like to, to say, see is that at some point in this next year, we do an economic development workshop for the community. Not only for us, because we had that several years ago where Mr. Wanamaker came in, I think, I don't know that any of you were on the commission at that time, and really explained how businesses choose an area in terms of service businesses, mm -hmm. not necessarily larger businesses like Amazon, because for them it's like logistical, right? right. But for service businesses, it's based on a, on a demographic model. Mm -hmm. And I think by bringing that and having some sort of a, a workshop on that or any something for the community mm -hmm. and have somebody come in and present that as a community forum, I think that may help okay. to understand. Mm -hmm. Okay, sure. <clears throat> I think that um, I think both of y'all are, are, are right to an extent. Okay. Um, we do have a responsibility to prepare 
our land and our city for uh, business. Mm -hmm. um, we, on one, let me finish that statement first. Um, we need to prepare. In other words, we should be, in my opinion, we need to be looking a lot closer at what we can do to advance the infrastructure of the city. Um, if people come, businesses come in and they go, well, I'd like to build on over on this property. And uh, so I'm gonna look into buying that property. Are you all ready for us to build? Can we build? And the city says, well, no, okay. you can't. Okay. And up until recently, we've allowed a couple of businesses to come in that should be on infrastructure mm -hmm. and they're not. Mm -hmm. And we say, oh, well, that's okay. Go ahead and build there. Uh, just be ready to hook up, uh, say, to sewer when, when it comes. Mm -hmm. But we have no plan or no intention to put sewer in there. Okay. And we're letting them do that. Now, now I, th I think we've, we've got a hold on that right now. And if they have to build where we have infrastructure. Okay. Um, but I think we need to focus more on that. We certainly focused on um, residential property. Um, and, and quite frankly, we've got so much residential going in. I mean, we're good till 2035. Okay. But, the okay. thing, but the thing is, you're going to bring all these more families are going to come in, and we still have nothing for them to do in the city. I take that back. We have great parks, and we and and we have a bike trail, and we're doing the eco thing. That's all great. I'm good with all that. But but they don't have the things that they're looking for. The, the restaurants and the shops. And yes. Well, so let's and, stay with that for a minute, because I mean that is a traditional role of a city to provide the infrastructure that allows the economic development to come. The market has to decide what what business goes where and all that. You, you don't get to do that. With respect to Lauren's points, would you concur with those that the need for a real strong or infrastructure plan? And I'm not saying you don't have it, but is, is critical here for the city. Heidi. Yes, yes, I think that Commissioner King or, brings up a really good point with infrastructure, but I also think that periodically it should be the role of management and the role of this commission quarterly to have a sit down and say. This is where we are with infrastructure. These are the businesses that are looking to come in. This is what we are planning on doing, and this is realistically what we are not, it's not financially feasible to do. Mm -hmm. And I think that we have certain areas that we've identified where you have a small sewer hookup that you need, a, not, a, not a lot of, and correct me if I'm wrong, Mr. Peters, for example, in the CRA area, you, you, a business wanted to come in there, but there's no sanitary sewer, so they're not gonna come in. And no business is gonna go in there that needs a sanitary sewer, i.e. a restaurant, right. at all, unless there's sanitary sewer. Okay. And I think that it's, it's, not, it's easy to say that, but it's not so easy to finance all of that. And I think when we do this strategic plan in the budget, that I think that that has to be, you know, we have to really look at the reality of the money that we have and how we're gonna spend it to make it more efficient, because, because you brought up a great point with infrastructure and how are we going to do that? And then the, Mr. Peters, with a background in public works, I think you can realistically tell us what is the reality of being able to hook up, for example, in his district, Lake Helen Osteen Road, Catalina, that's a long way to hook up to sewer. But you need it because that area, especially when you look at what's coming in from the back end, you know, the, the demographics are there. And, and maybe could you just explain what you said that what the city has control over and what the market has control over? I think that's an important point. Mayor, yes. it, but before he does, I just want to say to the point of, of what we're talking about infrastructure, you, you, you target something that we all talk about this, right? Sewer. And I think it's also gonna take the political will of this 
dais up here to realize because what happens when we start having these conversations, we start getting these bullet points out there, or these political campaigns forced to soar. And the reality is that if, it, if we're not educating our community of what we're really trying to do as it relates to infrastructure and as it relates to why is it that we're doing certain things, it's just going to always come back and we're just going to be debating each other out here of what we should do or not do. So I think at the end of the day, it's also going to take all of us here to be on the same page. And, and, and it's not necessarily that we have to always agree, but realize the big picture here. And I think sometimes we, we, we lose track of the big picture. And that's why it, get, it becomes difficult if we're not in a core and realizing, because again, I, to what you're saying, Mayor, I, I can hear it already. The city is going to force us to sewer. And then some of us are going to piggyback on that for political reasons, right? And then again, we're, we're defeating the purpose. So I just wanted to throw that in because I think at the end of the day, all these things are great, but it's going to take the political will of us to unite and realize what is important in the bigger picture here. And, and if I may, um, just to, before we lose the, uh, the thought here, a while back we had a meeting and I spoke about a webinar sem seminar that I was part of, uh, League of Cities, and it was called Growing Our Cities. Mm -hmm. And I think it was um, some of the um, uh, cities, uh, uh, Clearwater, um, and I forget the other city, the one which is famous for their water plains, right? Mm -hmm. And so one of the mayors from that city said, water plus infrastructure equals more business. Mm -hmm. So yes, we definitely have to spend, and I speak, um, because of my district, is the oldest district, and I always joke with Mr. Peters because I always say we're the, we're the uh, orphans. Um, and, and I understand the reason why we haven't grown District 3 as far as Deltona Boulevard and Saxon Boulevard because we don't have the infrastructure. And before I was an elected official, I w I've always been, since I moved here in 1999, I've always been involved in the community. And I, um, I, I volunteered with, um, with Jerry Mays and went out and, and solicit, solicit a few fast food chains mm -hmm. um, back in those days. And one of the things they came back to me and said was, we went out there, we stood in the corner of, you know, Deltona Boulevard, Saxon Boulevard, we clicked the cars, on the cars right. that came in and out, mm -hmm. and you have more cars going out mm -hmm. in the morning mm -hmm. than staying for lunch mm -hmm. in the city of Deltona. And, you know, a lot of businesses look at their lunch, mm -hmm. um, sure. you know, mob to see mm -hmm. where the most of the money right. comes in. Um, and one of the things, and, and I'm talking about Pollo Tropical, I mean, you know, since 19, uh, 2000, early 2000, I've been, you know, reaching out to them to see. They were very interested in Deltona, but when they came and they did their study, mm -hmm. they were very mm -hmm. disappointed to the point where they wanted a Deltona Boulevard office, but then when they found out you have to pay for your own infrastructure, your hookup, your mm -hmm. sewer, not the sewer, but the, you know, septic, and that was going to cost them more money because if if they were buying half an acre, now they have to buy a whole acre mm -hmm. because the half, half was for the septic. Mm -hmm. And so this turned them away. And what they're saying, a lot of businesses are saying is, you have more people going out to work mm -hmm. out of Deltona. Mm -hmm. They have lunch, they have breakfast out of Deltona, they have lunch out of Deltona, and then they come home and they just want to go home and cook for their family. They don't think about going out to eat and unless they go out on the weekends. So, um, you know, these are the other things that we have to think about, and and and, and everyone here had a good point. Uh, you know, and uh, infrastructure is the most important thing here in Deltona, at least in my district. And I think that the only thing that's going to change District Three is infrastructure. Um, I'm pretty sure the other districts who are open have something open for business probably um, are able to bring them in. But we just recently had. Uh, you know, some, something that was gonna be very good for the uh, District 3, they're still undecided because there is no infrastructure. So, okay. you know, we're always gonna go back to infrastructure and, and, and this is a decision we all have to make. And I know that we help a lot of organizations, but there's gonna come a time that we're gonna have to say, you know what, we gotta, stay, we gotta take care of home first mm -hmm. and decide to put all our money into the infrastructure of the city 
get it together, and then open up to help other organizations. Herb, Herb I'm sorry. Junior, go ahead. There is, everybody up here has, has voiced it, and they're 100% correct. And Victor, Victor nailed it. We have to come together as a body. But the number one obstacle when it has come to the infrastructure, you know, I've only been here four and a half years. And it has been, you know, and, and to be honest, when you're not on this dais, the things you hear, you tend to, you go with. You know, I was one that was wrapped into the no floor sewer, but we nailed it because that's coming from a residential standpoint is I don't want that high utility bill. I don't want this, I don't want that. And now that I'm here, it's not that I want to force you on sewer. It's that in order to bring the infrastructure to the city, the city was built around the Mackel brothers as a mm -hmm. residential community. Mm -hmm. And the restaurants as well, they, they want to be here and so do the businesses based on the lunch crowd. That also goes towards the residents. We need the residents mm -hmm. to say, now we have that lunch crowd. But when it comes down to budget time, when staff, we'll just say, brings forward and says, I need $100 million, and I'm just throwing a number out there. This is not a real number. Do not use this number against me. I need $100 million to put this infrastructure in. We're all going to choke and gasp and probably pass out. But in all essence, it comes down to where does that money come from to now take a residential community and make it into that thriving hometown feel? Because before it was, we need jobs. Well, we're starting to bring in jobs. Now it's, oh my God, I wanted these jobs, but oh my gosh, look at this traffic. You know, this is great, but, but, and these are things that all encompass wanting to have it. So we want the hometown feel. I want the restaurants. I want this, but oh, can you get rid of the traffic? Mm -hmm. Mm -hmm. So again, I think, as Ms. Heidi said, it is an education. You guys can have everything that you're asking us for, but it comes with a, a price. price. Mm -hmm. okay. And are you willing to pay that price okay. so we can put the infrastructure in? And I believe what staff has been doing, and I'm gonna pass it to John, is if that company's coming in, they're putting lift stations in, they're adding it, so we can connect to their hubs, and he can get more detail on that, but some businesses are willing to do it. You know, we lost a few businesses back off of Saxon because they didn't have the infrastructure. We've lost them off of Deltona Boulevard, Howland County. So, John, I want to pass it to you because this this all comes down to infrastructure. I can see you're biting your lip to jump in. Before you, before you pass it on to Mr. Peters, I want to clarify that when I said we need to work on the sewers, I am talking about streets where businesses want to open up. I'm not talking on forcing residential areas to be put on sewers. That's not what we're referring to You're right here. You're talking about commercial sewers. I am talking about uh, commercial sewers uh, where com businesses can come and open up, you know, within the commercial area. So I don't want um, to be get beat up on saying that I'm trying to force everyone onto sewers. Right. That's not what we're saying. Okay. We're talking about business commercial sewers. Okay. But can we, before John says that, John, can you clarify, this is what I was told previously, was that if that infrastructure's there near the residents, then they're gonna need to hook up to it. So that's, that's the whole thing. So if the infrastructure's there, do they not then um, obligated to hook up to that? Okay. Commercial, yes. Uh, if you're within a thousand feet of sewer on your commercial property, you are obligated to connect. Um, residential, if under state statute, it's 300 feet. Under our city ordinances, we do not require them to connect. So there's a little bit of disparity there. Okay. Uh, so while, let while me ask I John just to pause. That's an important statement for y'all to make, because as I've tested out here, I, see, I hear people saying commercial sewer is good you know, which is a different message. Now, obviously there are variances in there, but that's just an important I, point. I just want to encapsulate something of everything I've heard. And I think this is kind of the image I want you all to think about as we go through the strategic planning process. And many of you all have heard me use this analogy. 
is when I was in public works, I consider myself the canvas maker. You know, we provide the utilities, the roads, and the things you need to have for the development to occur. That's the canvas. You want a good 30 canvas in order to develop. The commission role is you're the frame maker. You provide the enhancement to make that painting even better. That's the community. That's the, the center. The other things, the recreation facility, those are the things that people want to see as a business that's available. They want to see those extra funds. They want to see that there's an art program and what have you. That's where you build the frame. And then with the planning department and you all, we put the palette together. That is our code. Our code controls what color the paint's going to be, what the image is going to look like. And so in that partnership, the private sector is the one that does the painting. But we can control the painting through the canvas, the frame, and the palette. And that's really what the strategic planning process should be talking about. And I think the very first discussion really emphasizes that. Public works pretty much takes care of the canvas. Now, the private sector helps in terms of having the land available. But then, you know, you all also have to create that frame. Do you want a beautiful, ornate, baroque frame? Or do you just want a simple rustic barn wood frame? Uh, that's a decision you make in terms of what you want to do to enhance that painting. And then through code, we do the palette and, the, and what colors we want to have and all that. So that's the analogy I want to you know, okay. put out there. Right. Fisher, let me go back to your point about uh, all of you together. The value of a strategic plan to me is it enables you to answer to the public why you're doing something. And to me, why you're talking about commercial sewer and infrastructure is because you want people to have local shopping and restaurants and jobs. And I think it, often that gets lost. People get, you know, they get, we, we're doing this, why are we doing it? Here's why. And I, will everybody agree with you in the end, Niall? But at least, you know, you have a rationale and if you all can share that rationale, it helps you be consistent. We're doing this because we're gonna, you know, create a, a hometown. That's what we really want here. So giving people that context uh, for, for a, a portion of the public at least will make a difference, you know? So go, go ahead, please. Mayor, if I can jump, using the word framing. So for example, I wanna say thank you to Commissioner King. Uh -huh. Why? Part of the framing is how we speak Mm -hmm. what we put out there. So he started saying we had nothing, but then he says, no, hold on. Yeah. We do have, we have trails, mm -hmm. right? Sure. We have parks. So if we can help in that framing aspect of the things that we do have, I think it's gonna better that, that conversation mm -hmm. instead of we don't have this, we don't have that, but the idea that us, again, as a commission, we can disagree on a lot of things, but to come together and realize, okay, what do we have? Mm -hmm. And these things are also part of, as much as we like it or don't like it, we have Joe, we have the center here. Mm -hmm. So what can we benefit from that? Mm -hmm. So I think, thank you, John. I, I think the, the, the framework aspect that you said that we have, if we come in with that mind, mindset that we are the frameworkers of this and we're gonna have some lively debates and that's great because that's gonna bring the best out of this. But if at the end of the day, we can come out with a core and realize we might not have this, but guess what we do have? We have all these other things. And then we start speaking as, as a team, as a unit, as a body. I think, I mean, the sky's the limit. We, we, we have the potential, but we have to come together with that framework. Doesn't mean we're always gonna agree. And it's okay to disagree. Sure. But if we come with that mindset and realize all the great things that we have, I'm not gonna mention, but we have a neighboring city that's killing us. And we have more potential than they do. You know why? Because they're framing their story much better than we are. We are a trail town. We're a designated trail town. We have a neighboring city that's taking advantage of that. Mm -hmm. They're framing it. Mm -hmm. We're not. Mm -hmm. So I, 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 I concur, framework and, and, and again, if we can all start getting into that conversation, I get it. We all not allowed to, at the parks, that's fine. But if we're aware of what's going on in the parks, if we're aware of what's going on with our trails, if we're aware of what's going on in the center, and we start speaking about these things, 
that then is going to create that buzz out there. Talk about business. Businesses want to come in places where people are, 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 are talking about great things. Mm -hmm. Businesses do not want to come into an area that is all about negative. Mm -hmm. You know, I, I speak to, to a lot of residents. We, we complain that Orange City has all the business. Well, guess where all those businesses wanted to be years ago? Here in Deltona. Mm -hmm. Guess what Deltona said? Not in our city. Mm -hmm. Okay. So, so we, we got to come back to that mindset and realize that okay. framework. Thank you, John. I think that was great. Okay, so one clear goal we want out of this is economic diversification and expansion. Uh, and clearly you've got a number of strategies, which I'll note in the plan. You've got your ecotourism strategy, which brings people in, ideally. You've got your health care strategy, which brings lots of very good jobs. You've got your logistics enterprise. You know, that's another good strategy for there. The center itself is, is, is another thing. That's, that is a wonderful facility. I've, I've actually never seen a city of your size have a facility that nice. You know, you got to go to the Tampas and Miamis and all to have uh, uh, of that same quality. Obviously, there's a larger f square footage, but so you have something very unique there. All those can bring jobs, can create recognition. And, and to go to Victor, your point, yeah, it's all about framing and branding, you know. And, and I would remind you about my nine-year-old grandson said, I want to live in Del Toro because they got the best parks. <laughs> You know, and we take these kids to parks all over Lodgeway County. That wasn't a, an uninformed judgment there, <laughs> you know. Uh, so, you know, so we, there is a lot, and, and it's all really about y'all hanging together to do it. I mean, that's, that's the real key. So, and Anything else we want to talk about economic development before we leave that topic? I actually yeah. have a few sure. items that, so... In order to have that city center that everybody's talking about, uh -huh. I know we have brought it up before and talked about it, but I think it's vital that we show that plan. You know, I know there is, and I think staff was was supposed to be researching, I don't know where they're at on it, on grants that help individuals put that city together mm -hmm. and show, like, like you're saying, this is the framework. And the center, when it was, originally voted, which was right before myself coming on there, part of it was, you know what, it's in the heart, it's in the center, mm -hmm. let's structure around that. Mm -hmm. So we have this beautiful center, and I, I'm sure you've heard some negative on mm -hmm. it, but sure what have. we all would love to say is, like you're saying, we hear how wonderful it is all the time, but we still have that bad rep. Mm -hmm. And I think it's vital for us to continue to grow and expand around that. Mm -hmm. We have mm -hmm. to change that reputation. Okay. And that means putting it back to a community center, okay. putting it at that center hub, as that community center, and let's let's utilize that and say from here, this is this is kind of where we want to go. Okay. But when businesses see that, hey, we've that Deltona's got a plan here, you know, we've got the center, and then we've got this over here and this over here, and we want to expand on that. And there are grants and there are organizations out there that will help the city say, what do you want in your downtown? What is your frame? What do you want your framework to look like? And then those things are presented to your businesses. That's, mm -hmm. that's a big vision board, sure. you know, that basically showcases this is going to be downtown. And they say, if you build it, they will come. Mm -hmm. And as a commission, you know, we had voted that that corridor was going to be kind of the downtown okay. hub. Right. And after that, that's where items started coming in and, and showing you know, interest as well, because okay. they want to be in that downtown hub. Mm -hmm. So if we want that downtown hub, we have to show the vision of okay. that downtown hub, okay. which means the next step is, what do we see in that downtown? Like you're doing the strategic plan, mm -hmm. but a lot of people are a visual. Mm -hmm. And I think it's sure. important that we have that visual mm -hmm. and how do we convert it and do it correctly? Because if we just start throwing businesses up there, and this is no, nothing against any, I'm gonna use the city a little bit farther away, let me say Mount Dora. Mount Dora has a wonderful hometown feel. Mm -hmm. Sure. They're packed, they have wonderful events, but the number one thing they're lacking is what? Parking. Mm -hmm. So these are things we have to think of as well. Mm -hmm. So by having that visioning board and having it put correctly okay. together, 
we can say this core down here, we're gonna have restaurants, we have jobs over here, we have this down here, we have parking over here to accommodate when we have all these events going on. Because as of right now, where do we put infrastructure? How do we know where to put that infrastructure if we don't have that visioning Vision. of what it's supposed to look like and supposed to do? Okay. So as much as everybody's, to me, the first step is not, hey, let's get infrastructure in. It's let's almost like vision. going backwards to where we were with okay. doing the residential community with the Mackle brothers. That was all great dandy and done, but now we're wanting to make it that hometown feel. Okay. But where does the sewer go? Where does this go? Where does that go without that visioning? Okay. So to me, the first step that has to be done is that vision board needs to be completed and our reputation has to change. And it does start here. It starts with all of us. Um, and sometimes I'll be the first to say, I'm sorry, I do get heated in the moment and I've got a, my, my Italian hot head comes out and I'm, I, you know, I apologize, but, um, you're right, as a commission, we are what they look at first and foremost. So honestly, what I would love to see first and foremost is that visioning board, okay. where do we wanna go, what do we wanna see okay. in the city? Okay. Because once it's out there that, hey, we wanna have restaurants, we wanna have this, we wanna have that, then it can kinda be in its place. Okay. Some cities even have it down to what color buildings they're allowed to paint, what color fronts they're allowed to have, almost like a homeowner's. Mm -hmm. You know, do we want to go to that extent? Okay. And to me, these are important questions that have to be answered by the commission and the, the residents yeah. before we can say, hey, let's throw this infrastructure here, 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 and here, and here. Because okay. if I build it over here, but everybody's coming over here, it makes no sense to me. It's a waste of money. Okay. So let's stay with that point. I mean, is, is the first task here really to envision the Daltona you want uh, in, in, in graphic form, actually, so that people can see it as opposed to just words, so that you have your images, and if, if this around the center is what you're gonna to try to build a downtown, that, that's fine, or whatever it is. Do we have some consensus on that? And I'll ask it, because it's really a work task that John will have to move forward if, if that's what you want done, so. Victor? I, oh, I'm sorry. Oh, I'm sorry. I think that um, that should be a decision made by the residents of where they would like to see this downtown area uh, being built. Um, we're all, we, we all represent different districts and we're all going to root for our own district um, where we would be. So I think it should be something that probably should have been discussed at the, uh, you know, the sessions okay. that you had, guys were holding. But going back to the infrastructure, um, I speak for District 3 right now. Mm -hmm. And in order for us to grow District 3 into a commercial area, we need the infrastructure. There is no question about it. Okay. Uh, and I'm talking about infrastructure for the commercial mm -hmm. areas. Commercial areas. Um, and I know that in speaking to uh, the residents of District 3, they're really desperately looking for that. It's, okay. it's owed to them. It's been a long time. Okay. District 3 is an older section of Deltona. Mm -hmm. um, that's the first area that was built and then all of a sudden it was forgotten. Okay. Um, there are a lot of commercials that are interested in District D, but because of the infrastructure, they're turning away. Okay. So I understand, you, you know, what was being said, but, you know, I, I would like to hear more. I, I, think, I think we've said a lot of what the commissioners would like to see, but I want to hear more of what the residents spoke about right. and, and, and what their concerns were in the meetings that you okay. were holding. Okay. Right. Yeah. I'm going to follow up with um, Anita. Okay, I told to use first names. I know, I'm so <laughs> <laughs> Just to, to follow up on some of the things that she says. And <coughs> this was years ago, and maybe the mayor was part of this, but I know the city at some point in time had drawings, and I think they broke up the city either in three or four areas, and every area had a color scheme to mm -hmm. it. Mm -hmm. The buildings had a certain facade to give you a yep. feel of where you're going into. Mm -hmm. um, so maybe that's something we can look into. The other thing, as it relates to a downtown area, I'm not saying that where the center is, is a bad area, but I think one of the things that we also need to realize that our city is, is shaped in a very different way. Um, and I think while it creates a challenge, it creates an opportunity not necessarily to Let's use um, Deland. Deland historically has a downtown area. 
I don't know that we can get there. But I think what we can do is throughout the city and the different districts provide an opportunity of somewhat of a feel mm -hmm. of a downtown area mm -hmm. where people don't feel that they necessarily have to travel all the way up to Holland because there's something going on there. But we can diversify these districts with different downtown areas, if I can call it that for right now, um, and in lieu to whatever work was done years ago, maybe we could piggyback on that. So whenever you're in District 3, well, District 3 has a certain feel to it, a certain color to it. Um, that way, you know, people know where they're at, and, and it creates that that environment of, of a feel. Um, so I, I'm not necessarily so much in looking for a area to consider downtown, uh, because I think it's going to be a challenge here, mm -hmm. uh, because honestly, the center is not in the center of the city. Uh, it, it's on the north end of the city, and it becomes a challenge. So, But I think it's, it creates an opportunity for us to say, okay, maybe that center area is going to be composed of this. Mm -hmm. Maybe District 1 is going to have this, District 2 is going to have this, and then that way we, we can kind of like okay. even help traffic with that aspect of it. Okay. You well, know? So really what you're talking about, hometown nodes, there are a variety yep. of nodes yes. around town and, and that I you think can you identify nailed it. with. I think you nailed it because we need to take advantage of the major points, and the major points are three exits not sure. one, not two, but three yeah. exits off uh -huh. of I-4. Sure. And then we have, at the other end of Holland, we have an entrance point into the city. So we almost have four or five major points coming into the city that and we could... And let's not forget 415. That's, That's what, what I'm saying. Yeah. Oh, yeah. you said okay. Well, we have pretty much two there, Doyle yeah. and right. Holland. Mm -hmm. Right, So we have major entrance, so five. So we basically have five great entrance points. Okay. Okay. Right. right. So there, yeah. these right are things, right? Doyle. So we have major areas yeah. coming into the city. I think you nailed it that okay. we can say, you know, this is the medical. And I believe that's what Jerry was calling that at the beginning yeah. was this okay. is the medical district, mm -hmm. you know, and then we got, you know, now two hospitals coming right. in and the jobs. So I think this is this is where we have to get these visioning boards mm -hmm. because in order for us to properly put infrastructure in, we got to have these the framework set up. Okay. All right. So it sounds like to me, one, there was some work done in the past yes. that ought to be resurrected and looked at yes. and updated. It may still fit, or uh, and, and clearly a part of that process is let the community look at it. Is that what we want or not? Uh, and then, you know, I think you're right. You, you bring that together, and, and that's multiple nodes probably, given the nature of this city, uh, and that's fine. Uh, and then you, you articulate that, and then staff have to lay out what's a reasonable, feasible financial plan to get there, you know, and, and that bases on grants and resources and all sorts of variables that we can do this one first as opposed to that one. Uh, but, you know, that's, that's the process that you want. So it's really, it's almost a, a master community redevelopment exactly. plan. <laughs> you know, Michael Brothers had their plan. You all have got to redevelop that plan now because it, it really no longer works. Mm -hmm. yeah. can, can I just um, uh, piggyback on that? Um, years ago, I was on that committee when, mm -hmm. when that happened, and that was, um, uh, I know what it was during the time frame when Mayor Mulder was here. It may have been 2008, 7, 8, something like that, and they mm -hmm. formulated exactly what Victor said. And it was a, commu uh, was a community engagement. It was here in the chambers, mm -hmm. and it really talked about a lot of things. It talked about streetscaping. It talked about signs. Right. If you look at our signs at Station 65, if you look at the signs at our um, Sheriff's substation, all those signs and that format was born out of that visioning session. The, the, the style and everything else came out of there. It went as from everything to road, um, road decorations to street lights to everything. And it was, and it was different, different variables. Because if you look at the city of Deltona, and I think the reality that this commission has to look at, like everyone, we have certain cards that we have been dealt mm -hmm. from the inception of this city and from 30 years of being under the county and not have had the infrastructure, the road infrastructure, the sanitary sewer put in for all those years where we had no local government. We didn't have representation. We had one representative for a vast city. And when this city incorporated, it incorporated with 55,000 people. Think about that. 55,000 people when this city incorporated. It was already a vibrant city at that point. And 
we can dream if we had all the amount of money in the world to change a lot of things, but the reality is you have a four, four different hubs at least, and that's what Chris Boley used to say as a former planning director. The city is so big, you can do four different downtowns. In each quadrant, you can do that. And in Daltona Boulevard, District 3, that used to be the old vibrant section. And now in District 2, in Anita's district, you have all, because of the land that's out there, mm -hmm. the land is the driver. Mm -hmm. And when you look at, at, at your district and at your district, it's more residential. You are on the cusp of a lot of different things in your district. And District 4, Dana's district, is in the center. It has old, it has new, it has parks, it's, it's, but not as much economic development there except an old stretch. So what we really need to do is re be realistic about what we can do to this city and how, how we can use what we have and build on what we have and then expand the commercial sewer and the infrastructure. You're looking at natural gas too. You're gonna have to expand that. Mm -hmm. But I also wanted to just say one thing to what Victor said. We have so many assets in this city that we don't promote. Look at, by you, the boat ramp, the community center, your district has so much, the center, you have trails, what you have out in your district too, Commissioner King, you have such cool stuff out in that area. You have a lot of residents, but you also have open land surrounding in the back. You have so much, which you're gonna have coming in from the Lake Helen area is something that's gonna have to be dealt with. So we need to come together and look what's going to sustain this city, not for the time we're in office, mm -hmm. but for the next five, 10, 20 years. Okay. Because people have invested in this city and they continue to invest in this city with their homes mm -hmm. and their businesses. And we as a, as, a, as a board of directors for a large municipal corporation, that's what this is. We owe it to our stakeholders, mm -hmm. the residents that have invested in us to make this a viable city. And with every negative we hear, uh, I'm just gonna say this straight up because Mr. Peters is the first manager that has actually addressed the negatives and has been honest about what we lack and what is problematic. Normally it was always, always glossed over. Oh, well, this, this, and this. And the next statement I'm gonna make does not mean that we should gloss over. But when we feed off the negative, which is human nature, we have to try to counter it with the positive. And every time we hear something negative, you can acknowledge if it's a true negative problem and it has to be worked on, but we also have to promote the positive. Mm -hmm. And I think we have a really good team inside City Hall with our social media. It ha we have to frame it, and that is our job, okay. to frame it and give Mr. Peters the instructions on how to bring out the best that we have. We have Lyonia Preserve. Mm -hmm. No other city has this. No other city has a building like the center, like it or not. Nobody in this Volusia County has that kind of a, that kind of a, an operation over there. The trails that we have, we have a boat ramp on Lake Monroe. Who else has that to the degree that we have it, that we can work on that? We have so much here. Well, so if I go back to John's analogy of frame, what y'all are framing is, a, is really a multi-node city with multiple gathering places, where you want to call them downtowns or not there. People work can come together and see neighbors and, and just have that experience of kind of being in home. And part of that frame is here's where we're going, you know, and 20 years from now, you know, Y'all can be a highly vibrant city with a lot of very stuff, you know. You got a great location, you got great natural resources, you got all this stuff. And that to me is about poli what I call policy leadership. It's framing the future in an exciting, energizing way, you know, and hanging together on the tough decisions to get there, <laughs> you know, because there'll be some tough ones. But it's that framing. And so if we talk about it's both economic development strategy and community development strategy we're really talking about here. And how do you marry those? Because they go together. Because the stronger your economy, the more nice things you can afford. <laughs> you know, uh, and you can have it all when you have a good economy. Uh, so that's 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 where you want to go with this. And I'll I'll try to capture that in a set of statements. Uh, 
and, and clearly I've heard you about the vision boards. So I'll, I'll capture that because that's a, a key part of, but I think it's articulating the community, hearing the community, making sure you got broad support. And I'm sure John is over there drawing. Let me jump in real quick. Yeah, please. Thank you. Um, <laughs> you can see we're, my we're, cat. We're, we're doing the painting <coughs> analogy. We're doing the painting analogy, and I want to take it one step further, uh, based on some things I've heard already. And that is maybe instead of having a single masterpiece, we have a gallery. Mm, great. Um, mm -hmm. And the galleries in neighborhoods. Yeah. Um, maybe you know District Three, the older section of town. We have a vision for that area, and we put a plan together on how we achieve it. Mr. King's area, we know that with 415 and development occurring, that there's gonna be a demand for more commercial. Um, and then we know that we want, you know, I, I'm gonna tell y'all right now, I hate the term downtown. Uh, I would rather call it a nouveau downtown, because <laughs> in my vision of downtown is the old style downtown Orlando. Uh, and even they're trying to make it a nouveau downtown, more energetic and more vibrant. Uh, so, you know, let's use nouveau downtown or something like that. But um, even our downtown area, we would have you know, a frame and a, and a viewpoint. And you know, maybe what we need to look at is a gallery instead of a single painting. Because I don't know that the city fits in a single painting. But I think as a gallery, um, you, know, you now have the opportunity to say, okay, this is a rural area and we're gonna put you know, barn wood frame around it. And this is the area around the center that we want to be a vibrant community for people to go to. We're gonna put you know, a gold gilded frame around it. Um, and so um, let's not focus on a masterpiece, let's focus on the gallery. Okay, great so would, so would that be so with your gallery and you know I agree downtown when you think of downtown I the last thing I want to have a vision of is Miami and give people that you know and I know people love hometown people love that hometown sure, feel sure. Um, we would need to do a, an, an extensive amount on branding huh what is it uh, like Village, village centers. centers, yeah. Villages. That's Villages. a good. Village that's a good centers. feel for oh, us because we do thing. have the residents, and then mm -hmm. you know we want these these little centers that they have, and the center is called the center, so it kind of. But we would also need to, with that, have have a lot of. Uh, it's almost like branding, I guess, because we want to make sure mm -hmm. that we have this mm -hmm. out there sure. and branded properly. Um, but I, I I think I like that. I like mm -hmm. that, Lauren. I like that. Mm -hmm. I like them both. I mean, it's beautiful. Welcome to the gallery. <laughs> <laughs> that's, that's a great image. I mean, that is. I mean, and that, that fits this community because it is a diverse community. Mm -hmm. <laughs> you know, and it has different history. So, okay. So we're talking, uh, it's a community of Deltona's, a group of village centers, <laughs> you know, and you can choose the center you like, you know. Or gallery centers or? Galleries, yeah. Mm -hmm. You know, you leave the, the wordsmith to the branding experts, but yeah, it, it is a branding, okay. I'm sure by the time we're done, John is gonna have a, a picture for us of that gallery. <laughs> he's working on it. We'll, we'll have it draw, he's gonna be drawing it on board before we leave. It'll, it, it, it'll be in your email later. That's <laughs> right. <laughs> That's a All good right. idea. <laughs> I'm all about that, but on bikes. <laughs> okay. So uh, let's talk about recreation for just a few minutes, if we can. That's another really popular Look, thing here. Look, he's getting there. all twitchy over here. Recreation. <laughs> all right. So what do you want to say about recreation? I mean, I just, you know, people like it. Uh, people want more of it. Uh, obviously, your ecotourism strategy mm -hmm. contributes to it. Your center provides a lot of entertainment options in a different kind of recreation form. Mm -hmm. uh, what do you hear? I mean, what, what more are people looking for or won't? Tell me. Pick, well, go ahead. I'm, I'll use the hashtag that Parks and Rec use, and it's, it starts in parks. Okay. Um, yeah. And some, sometimes people go, well, what do you mean it starts in parks? Well, it does. You know, a park, said, and I use West Crow, because West Crow, even though Dewey is great, but West Crow is within the, in, in the city, in the community, where people are always, we call it the hub, where people are meeting there. As a matter of fact, today they have great arts and craft going on there with, um, food trucks, so that's great. Uh, but I think 
we're starting to see at least, and I've had conversation with John when it comes to parks and rec, actually a parks and rec. For many years, what we had was just taking care of, of, of parks, but there was really no recreation. Okay. Um, and as we're continuing to move forward, I mean, we have a, a youth basketball league with a little bit over 200 kids already. And we have some challenges. What are those? We need more coaches. Mm -hmm. uh, but I think those are great opportunities. In saying all that as well, as we continue to move, been having conversation with John, I'm going to mention it, John, of having a gym. Why? Why is it important? Well, if you take the time, <laughs> so if you take the time to go to West Crow, which is the only gym that we have where we play our games and things like that, you're going to realize that we've outgrown it. Mm -hmm. You know, we, we have to stay with the times. And I know in speaking with John and, and looking at an area that is not necessarily in District 5, believe it or not, but it's in an area where it's also going to create that attention and it gives us then an opportunity, as we always talk with Parks and Rec about being self-sustained, mm -hmm. that it starts being used to other things. Mm -hmm. um, and, and I just wish that more folks would go out to our parks and, and see the great things that we have. The all-inclusive of fitness centers that we have in our parks. West Crow, people are going crazy. I, I, I see folks using the trail and they're like, you know, we're glad that we have this exercise equipment outside that we can just come and use. So there's so much great opportunity that we have with our parks and rec um, that, that I think um, we just have to keep pushing that envelope. And I know I hear sometimes, oh, there's a lot of money spent in parks and rec. Well, guess what? It's where people come in and, and congregate. You look at DuPont. Mm -hmm. We have our, our West Volusia Senior Softball League. Mm -hmm. Go there on a Monday night, Wednesday night, on a Friday night. Mm -hmm. You're going to see the excitement that's happening there. Mm -hmm. And I think the more we can continue to promote these things, and there's still parks and our eco parks that some of our residents don't even know exist. Mm -hmm. Mm -hmm. And again, that comes back because of our framing. Mm -hmm. But if we start, thank you, David, for using that shirt. If we start promoting our Echo Parks as well, you're gonna start realizing there's just so much great mm -hmm. things going. I know we have some challenges, mm -hmm. right, about staying green or not green. But I think as we hybrid, if I can use that word in this city, mm -hmm. to try to get the best that we can out of both worlds, mm -hmm. we have some great e eco parks, we have some great parks, we have some great recreations that we're working on to bring that community out here. Now, yes, I get it. Not everybody plays basketball, not everybody plays football, not everybody goes to the park, but it doesn't mean we should not be investing in it. Mm -hmm. Because at one point, which goes back to our conversation, Deltona was known as what? The retirement city. Mm -hmm. Well, guess what? That's gone by. So every time I hear that, I say, time out, explain that to me. And I tell them, no, this is where we're at now. So we're, we're becoming much younger and we have to be providing these mm -hmm. utility or, or recreational areas, not just for our kids, but for adults as well. And it, so like, when, it talk, when it comes to Parks and Rec, I'm all in because I see it. I see it all the time, how effective it is and how great it can be, especially for all of us. You talk about medical. What better way than staying healthy by doing things in the parks? What better way than collaborating with, with, with our hospitals and, and our health industry mm -hmm. to provide those opportunities? So uh, I'm all about Parks and Rec, I, I, I think justifiably so. Uh, and that's why I'm always posting pictures of everything that's happening so that people realize it. And, and I think, again, we just have to do a better job in, in marketing that. But, but for you, it's, it's really a community building. Absolutely, yes. That's what you're really building is yes. community. Yes. So some people see it as a gym and say, well, what an expense that is. Right. But if you take the time just to go to our gym, mm -hmm. you're going to realize that it's more than that. So absolutely, it's more than just a building. Mm -hmm. It's an opportunity. So I would like to jump in. And we just I just had this conversation, I think twice, with someone in the community. Um, I moved here in 1999. In Right after moving in here, I became a member of the Deltona Civic Association. Okay. I don't even know if anybody here has even heard of it. But we had a Deltona Civic Association, uh -huh. and we used to meet at the Little Red Schoolhouse mm -hmm. off Lake, Lake, uh, Lakeshore Drive. Let me just mention some of the events that were put together by the Deltona Civic Association members, and I think we still have some staff here in the city that were part of that group, all right? We used to have the Deltona Festival. I think it was May or April or May. Spring Fest? Deltona Spring Festival. Mm -hmm. We used to have the Home and Garden Show, mm -hmm. which went from Friday, Saturday to, uh, Friday, Saturday, Sunday, at the Community Center on Lakeshore Drive. 
we held the Deltona, we had a Deltona Art Center mm -hmm. off Deltona Boulevard, mm -hmm. okay? We had a Christmas in July. Mm -hmm. We had, um, then we added the Festival of Nations, which we held maybe for four years and it was a hit. The last Festival of Nations that we held, we had 13 different folklore dance group from different parts of the country. We had the uh, Paint Your Heart Out, mm -hmm. which people, we would give out, and this was all one organization, Deltona Civic Association. We would drive around the city of Deltona, drop off flyers. People would fill out these flyers, or these applications. We would pick three or four. We would go out and get youth from the school and from nonprofits. Home Depot was one of the um, stores that would donate the paint. Mm -hmm. Parents and kids went out and painted these three homes mm -hmm. in order because these were people, you know, to, to preve prevent them from getting uh, pointed out by the city because their house was run down. But they were elderly, they couldn't keep up or what, for whatever reason. This organization, Paint Your Heart Out, took care of that. We had, um, lately, the Butterfly Garden, which Jerry started. We had Deltona Middle School open up the most beautiful garden, Butterfly Garden, that was taken care of by the students. Why so, did they all go away? Okay, that, so, so all that, you volunteers. did all that. It was vol okay, so volunteers. Okay, so the decline in volunteers. We were all volunteers okay. and there's a lot of things all this was done by volunteers from the city of Deltona who took the time because they care about their community okay. and did all this okay. and we can still do it but okay. you need volunteers okay. all right. so we have a beautiful center mm -hmm. and we have still have open land behind the center mm -hmm. which um, is still there and we have an amazing staff at the center. Mm -hmm. So the only thing that I see that is prohibiting us, and I'm gonna preach back on it again, from doing community events there, is that any time an event is held there, they have to pay. And this recently came up when we had a group and mm -hmm. you know, it was like, hey, can we donate it, can we not? Well, the commission in the past had voted based on a previous individual kind of was pushed to make it an event center, mm -hmm. which meant any event that was held, even if it was a city event, it's basically transferring money from here to here um, to host it. So in order for us to really make the beautiful center a place that is a community location, and I'm trying to choose my words carefully, is to, I think, change that stigmatism from event center back to community center. And I would like to see what creativity they can do to bring more of those events back to that community center. Because I think a lot of the events that Maritz is talking about were being held over at the Lakeshore community. And they were, I think, different times each week where they were allowed to go use it, I think, like, the, you know, the right, singers. But the, there's a difference, because even when we did events at the community center on Lakeshore Drive, we had to pay. It, there was never anything free at the community center on Lakeshore Drive. However, for those of us who have known the history of the Deltona Civic Association, that community, that piece of property belonged to the Deltona Civic Association. It was given to the Deltona Civic Association by the Mackle brothers. It came to a point where the Deltona Civic Association could not keep up with the maintenance. So they turned that property over to the city of Deltona with the condition that the, the Civic Association will be able to use the Little Red Schoolhouse for as long as they wanted to use free of charge. But, and, and to allow us to, to have the events that we had. That was the reason why the Civic Association 
was not charged, but it was events for the city. But as a nonprofit organization, we paid to use the community center at Lakeshore Drive. It was but, never but the free. Goal, the goal y'all want to have here are more events, festivals, Correct. things that can bring the community together to Correct. both appreciate that. Right. And, and we get down to the strategy level about what the policies need to be in place and right. how so, to use various yeah. facilities and all. But, but the goal is really to encourage more events. Right. So, you know, th so the whole point of me bringing that up is so if we have a community event at the center, in order for the staff at the community center to bring in more, not that I'm saying, hey, I want everything free, okay, right. is that if we're hosting, I'm going to throw one event out there, the backpack giveaway. A backpack give you to me is a community event that we have many businesses and from not just Deltona, but local communities, Deland, DeBerry, Orange City, contributing to, and the residents come there to get a backpack, say for school, to hand out, and there's hundreds of families there. Okay. And this is the portion I disagree with. That event is being paid for by somebody to hold it that, that, there. So what happens if that person, you know, Lord forbid, thankfully they've done it, but that's what I'm saying. To me, those are community events that it's not a profit making. Okay. It's a bring it for the community, for the good of the residents. Okay. Those are items I'm talking that we should maybe be looking at that they can maybe say, hey, how about we bring this to Deltona? Well, oh, I don't pay for it over here, so I'm just going to stay over here. Well, and so it, it gives them be, more leeway to bring things in. All right, so, so an objective to come back to you is revisiting policy about that. That that's, is that's re really revisiting the policy do. of that, yes, sir. Okay. And then and we want to both better promote the recreational capacity here and expand it. Would that be a goal for you? Okay. And then the YMCA, Victor, you may know this, a while back, I know we had, they had talks, I don't know their financials now, um, they had talked about working with the city to have the city working with the YMCA, and then there was even discussion of doing another trail down to there, but then we got a little spooked because of, ah, well, I know there I, was some stuff going on. I'm not on. sure that I'm going to say we got spooked. I think... We've seen their the, financial. The YMCA, it's for profit. Yeah, right. And, and I, I think that for the most part, uh, we, we, we had some interesting conversation, but I think that partnership, then we would have to open that partnership. For example, I'm gonna use a crunch. And, and, and I think what we need to be careful about or cautious is in the sense of when we start talking about groups, and what they do or what they don't do to our community, uh, that then we, we're gonna have to treat everyone the same. And, and I, I hear you when, when you keep speaking of the center. And then, but also part of me is like, I believe we had this conversation. So I'm gonna go back to framing. If you, if you just give me a second, Anita. I'm gonna go back to framing that I think at some point in time, when we make a decision here, whether good, bad, or ugly, if I can use those phrases, Either we're gonna to stick to it to move forward, or we're gonna always be going back to try to hash something that's just gonna create even more challenges. I'm not saying that I'm totally against the mindset. So for example, let's talk about it. You've mentioned it, the center. I recall us having a conversation up here of being called the center. So the center has been promoted as a center for I don't know how long. If we even think about starting to change that, and if this, this die's will to do it, and it does happen, just think about now all the refocusing that we have to do. So, so I think we just have to be cautious uh, that we don't just open our doors free willy um, and people try to take advantage of it. Because I'll tell you, those same agencies that come here and say it's too expensive, they're going other places and paying for it. Not only that, they're going other places and not asking for a break. They're just doing, it's 500, not a problem, it's 500. But for whatever reason, I get this feel that in our city, it seems like where everyone comes and wants a break. And I'm not saying that we should not give breaks, but why is it that it's only in our city that they come asking for breaks and not outside of it? Um, so I think we just, I'm okay with having the conversation, uh, but we have to put the cards on the table and realize that if we make a decision, whatever it is, even if we, we, we come back to this conversation and, and we change it, whatever it is, that then we stick to it. Because if not, we're just, guess what? In a few years when this body changes, guess what's gonna happen? There's gonna be folks wanting to change that as well. 
So until we don't create that consistency with ourselves here and realize, you know, we're gonna stick our guns to it. You know what, the center gets a bad rap, but we're not gonna be part of that conversation. We're gonna be part of the conversation and helping Joe and the staff over there to keep moving forward. But, and I'm only using the center because you brought it up. No, 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 you're fine, no, no. It, it, that's kind of like, and I'll, I'll bring it back to a gym. I'm sure when I, I mentioned the word gym, some folks might be saying, a gym, why do we need a gym? But guess what, let's have those conversations. Let's have realistic conversations conversations and not think about tomorrow, but think about three, four, five years from now. And once we make those decisions, and, and I think to me that's the challenge with, with, with us up here. And it, let's stick to the decisions that we make. I might be in the losing end of it, but at the end of the day, it's not about me. It's about the city and where the city is going to be or should be in three or five years. So let me help that process. So, so I think it's about whatever decisions we make, we just have to stick together and realize, because if not, guess what? In a few years, some of us might not be here, some of us might will, but guess what? Then you're gonna have other folks wanting to do the same thing. Well, I have an idea, and it's not a bad thing, but I think until we don't create some consistency, that's why you see our neighboring cities be successful in what they do, because they, they stick to the decision that they make, and they move forward. It, it, that's the only thing, it's, so again, I'm. I'm willing to have conversations, but at some point in time, these conversations have to come to an end, we have to come to a decision, and then we have to move forward with that. Because if not, guess what? We're gonna, and Joe, I'm, I'm sorry I'm using you because you're out there in the audience. We make his life even more miserable because all this time that he's out there promoting one thing, now he has to change and promote something else. So we have to be prepared for that as well and being cost effective to all these decisions that we make up here. Okay. Commissioner you know, King, you wanted to say something, Lauren? Right? I, I, think, um, I think one of the things that we should kind of look at when we start talking about recreation is looking at the things that we've done in the past that brought our community together. Okay. There are things, especially since the center's been built, that we're not doing anymore. And they were things, I participated in some of them, um, and I'm not saying bring them back because I participated in them. I'm saying bring them back because the community participated in them. Mm -hmm. And one of the big things that I've heard people say that they really, really miss is every month being able to go over to the amphitheater and have a little concert over there. Mm -hmm. It was free. Yep. Mm -hmm. The city paid for it. We had a uh, we had a fund that was about fifteen thousand dollars, that that paid for the entertainers that came there, and and what do we do? Oh, we have the center now. We're not doing that anymore, and and it stopped, and people loved it. On on a night when you had pouring down rain, a <laughs> hundred people would still show up. <laughs> It, if you if it was a good night, you'd pack that place out. Okay, and and it was free to the okay. community. So reinvigorating some historic events like that, like that and what drew what people together. Mm -hmm. uh, but it's so interesting. I just, just finished my strategic plan in the city of Parkland, and we had this very same conversation. They used to have a parade they called Parkland History Days or something, you know, and it but, for some reason died. And. And they said, we got to bring that back because it brings our community in, <laughs> you know, and so is that. Well, you know, now that Mayor. you mentioned that, the Civic Association also did the, crisp, the parade for the city of Deltona, okay. and because the, the volunteer went down, we turned it over to the city. Okay. So uh, even that was done Ma by Civic Association. Madam, Madam Mayor, might I make a suggestion that, so that we know somebody wants to speak? Because I know King has been there for a while wanting to speak, but that way we are aware. But, uh, but I want to say King, I think validates my point when we talk about the center. So for example, let's not think of the center all do, all things. Yeah. We okay. have so much things going on and it's totally, you're absolutely right. I used to love going out there. You're, out, you're outside, you're, you're, you're able to, to, to smell the breeze if that makes any sense, right? But you're absolutely correct. So there's no reason why we, just because the center is here doesn't mean we have to stop doing those things. Now, yes, there was a budget and I understand that then it was changed from doing it there and I think the budget was through Parks and Rec, that then we were gonna held some free concerts 
over at the center where people can come. But I think we can do a combination of. We, we don't, it, it's, it's not where we have to say we have the center and that's right. it. Right. No, let's use everything. Because I agree with you. I love those places. You put the food trucks out there. It's a totally different environment. And, and the fact is, you go to the center, we have a gold broke frame. Exactly. <laughs> but, we go over, but we go over to the amphitheater and we got a, a rustic uh, barnyard uh, <laughs> okay. one yes. by four frame. Right. I, I, it and goes. It a big difference. It, it goes, so we're talking about a gallery of recreational experiences yep. yes. as well as a gallery of yes. neighborhoods. Yes. And, exactly. and I think with, with that mindset, I, we can definitely move forward. And it's, let's enjoy every bit that we have instead of trying to pigeonhole everything in one thing to try to make that one thing work. Mayor, okay, what, do we what, have what's the connection of the... Um, of what the uh, I'll explain that in just okay. a second. Okay, because I know it's, I know that doesn't belong to the city. No, no, no. But I was, but I, but I, I want to, I okay. want to touch on, I want to touch okay. on this this conversation when everyone is is finished. Do, do we do we have a consensus to put that fifteen thousand dollars back <laughs> in a budget for next? It, next the strategic month? plan will be the framework for the budget for the budget. <laughs> um, so so what I wanted and everybody here has made a. a did you want to say something? Go for it before I. Yeah. Well, I don't I help me. It's it's a wide room. It's, it's, uh, I, I want to agree with Victor. Um, Deltona has probably some of the best parks. I mean, I've raised my son here, and we spend almost every day in a park for the last. For a gym here. I'm sorry. <laughs> for a gym. Now, and that's where I want to go with this because you are absolutely correct. I think the reason the center has such a bad stigma is because it was sold as a community center. It was supposed it was. to have indoor basketball gyms. It was supposed to have a rec center. It was supposed to have a community center. And then once everything was passed, you know, it switched to an event center. And I think a lot of the public got really upset about that. It seemed like Correction. a bait and switch. Yes. Correction, Dave. It, it, it didn't get passed. It didn't. Well, it did and it didn't. It, it got passed at the end, but I spoke to our city manager at the time, and her exact words were, well, yes, it was supposed to be a community center, but it morphed, is, was, that was her, those were her words, Evolved. it morphed into okay. the, the center. To the center, <laughs> which is exactly the opposite, because, you know, I concur with Victor. I get a lot of people, and they want a community center. Um, to be honest with you, me and a... Which means recreation facilities. Recreation, indoor okay. basketball, okay. you know. All right, okay. You know, Volleyball maybe sports. a little weight center. I don't okay. know what it is. A, a good example of this is uh, a council member from a neighboring city. Him and I took the sunrail with my son one day because we wanted to to take a ride on the sunrail because I know that was coming up going into the land and we wanted to see, yeah. you know, was it really worth the investment or not? It, and sunrail is a fun trip. You know, it's a shame it doesn't run more often. But uh, we went to Winter Park. And if you really want to see a community center, Winter Park has the best facility that I've ever been to as far as a community center. Okay. You come in, it has basketball courts, it has a swimming pool, it has a, a daycare, which, you know, I, I don't really recommend the city getting into after school pickup or child care, but it's something that maybe you can farm out to somebody else, rent the space out for somebody else. I mean, it, it has mm -hmm. the meeting rooms like the center does. It, it's, it's, it's like merged. It's like a merge of a center and West Crow is basically what it is. And it's a, it's a pretty state of the art facility and it was really nice. And honestly, I think from everybody I've talked to and my feelings too was that's what the center was supposed to be okay. and somewhere along the line morphed or whatever it, it didn't turn out like that but if I can expand you would like to see something like that in Deltona absolutely okay I, so I, I think that would I, okay. I think that's what most residents want to see they want to see activities for the okay. children sure and they still want to be able to have events you know and I, I think we need that's what that center should have been Okay. And somewhere along the line, that's what it was designed as, from my view as a resident okay. back then, okay. and it really didn't turn out that way. Okay. All right. And well, let me uh, y'all give me a lot of direction here. Uh, broaden the range of events. Use all the facilities of the city. Provide a number of diverse frames, from the gold baroque to the rustic barns, so that there's all that sitters. And one of the things is consider some additional facilities. 
Why don't you wrap up this part of Thank conversation? You. So just listening to all of this, um, it comes down to, to several different things. First of all, it comes down to when we talk about what we have here, Commissioner King, you brought up a great point with Lyonia, and you brought up the point about the center, and so did Anita. And the reality, when just listening to this conversation and knowing what's going on in the community, when the center was put there and when it was built and when it was discussed and everything, there were several different reasons why that center was done the way it was. One was the fact that we had received money from the Council on Aging, not from them, from an older lady that left like $750,000 to the city for activities for seniors. And we had to use that money as it went through the courts in a certain amount of time. So we took the initial seed money to start working on, because we own that land that in the past had been purchased under a previous uh, a group of people as public safety complex. So we had the land, we started doing that. And what it ended up, w having the visioning for the city of Deltona, the reality of the city of Deltona is we don't have a country club anymore that got torn down. We don't have a hotel anymore that has a viable restaurant, that has anything that a community can, somebody can even have an event, whether it's a birthday party, a wedding reception, or anything. We don't have anything in a city of 90,000 people. We have zero. We don't have a restaurant that can hold that type of, any type of a thing. So the center was going to encompass all of those things. And from that aspect, it did. Initially it was supposed to be, a gym was supposed to be attached to it, and all these logistical things, purchase the extra land, all that. Unfortunately, the center became a lightning rod for multiple reasons. Because it didn't have the gym, because it didn't, it didn't encompass those aspects, and then it became a point of where we shoved everything to the center. Okay. We eliminated Lyonia. We eliminated the Deltona Community Center. We eliminated a gym. And everything was to be brought to that center, which was completely unrealistic, because as everybody's made a point here, this city is diverse and it's big. And I'm gonna tell you right now, you survey let's say 70,000 adults in this city, and maybe 10% know where the center is, and what the center is, and what the center does. And the other, and probably 10% know that we have a community center on Lakeshore Drive, and another 10% know that we have Dewey Boster with the best soccer fields in Central Florida. It is all about messaging and branding and what, how we promote what we have. And we can't and we shouldn't pit the center against everything else. You heard what he said. I was down in Sanford last month. They said you have a, a state-of-the-art facility that nobody knows is there. And a lot of that is our fault because of the controversy that's been around there. And what we have to do, we are where we are with that. But what we have to do is encompass what we've talked about here today. Let's focus toward a gym. Let's bring back Lyonia. Let's revitalize a community center. It can be done. But it's going to take all of us, which comes down to what you said earlier, policy leadership. Policy leadership. Look at the policies that we have and decide. The center is not going to be all things Deltona. Okay. It cannot be. And it shouldn't be, exactly. But we have to find a way to do the other things that, that the community wants. I was down at Festival Park two nights ago. How many people know that Festival Park, what Festival Park has and what's down there? I know, but I mean as, uh, us. <laughs> But I mean, the reality is you're going to have another 10% of the population that knows what goes on at Festival Park. We have an app for that. Yes, we do. <laughs> but where, and, and how many people know that we have an app? 1%. Okay. Uh, right? Wow. Okay. We're going down with the I, I'm going to get it because the app is new. Okay. All right. Jump in here. Um, I would make this suggestion because um, Ryan Rackley and I have already talked about this is we need to do almost a strategic plan for Parks and Rec, yep. where we take an inventory of what we have, what the facilities, each facility can do and function as. 
see where we have deficiencies. Um, because I agree with you, the center was so controversial from the beginning that people put too many ornaments on that tree and it's been weighed down by the ornament that it was supposed to be all these things instead of what it truly should be. And we have other facilities that we can move some of those ornaments over to and have a more vibrant uh, situation. But um, I think out of this should be a recommendation that we go through a strategic planning process for mm -hmm. parks and recreation because I know Mr. Ramos and I have talked about a concept that I have in mind, but to get to that point, we need to go through a process um, because I, I have a vision of, of something else for the city that would help us on our economic development fund. But um, you know, we can we can begin that process with the strategic plan for Parks okay. and Rec and including in the budget. Let's take 15. Okay. Marcia, can I see you and John a second? Uh, I'd like to have a conversation with you about growth and managing growth. Uh, I'd like to do it at about the 10,000 foot level. Uh, Y'all are, uh, may or may not be in litigation, I don't know, so I'm going to rely on Marcia and John to say, guys, we don't need to go there and I'll ask you to respect it. Uh, we all understand that process, so, uh, so help me with that if you would. Uh, obviously, uh, you know, just about any community in Florida of any size is growing enormously right now. And this represents just one of the most controversial and difficult parts of your job. Uh, we as humans don't like change. And the closer that change is to us, the more we may dislike it, you know. I often use my own city as an example. I, I'd be happy if it was a thousand people, but that damn mayor, you know, he's got us on to 5,000 and, and more, and the mayor's my son, so I can say the damn mayor. Uh, you know, because he's a young man and he wants to do stuff and bring stuff and bring jobs and all those good things, you know, and I accept that, but it doesn't make me happy. Uh, so, you know, we all have a variety of feelings about Florida, and, and obviously one of the things we often say is, you know, whoever just arrived wants to close the door to anybody else because it's nice and we don't want to have to share it anymore. But the reality is Florida's growing and it's going to continue to grow. And uh, y'all are just part of the bigger picture about that. Uh, so I'd like just to talk about um, what, what are the factors you try to think about and balance it? Because there are, you know, every parcel that comes for you has its own history. It's all unique. There's, there's no stuff. Uh, and some things are highly controversial and some things aren't. <coughs> Uh, but as you think about that, what are the variables in your head that you have to think about as you try to make that decision? If you would just share that with me, I would, I would like to, to know that, if you, if you wouldn't mind. So I just have a question um, for Marsha. Because we're voting on something like this and we're going to be going over, um, is this something that we should be discussing here? We're not going to speak any specific you're not, project. Yeah, okay. you're not voting on anything. But at we're, this point. we're opening up a discussion. No, I mean you can talk, you know, about growth and and what you all see. We just need to keep it away from, okay, you know, the things that are. We do have one particular case that's in litigation. Well, that's where I was yeah. heading towards. And so we don't want to discuss that with any specificity. Okay, thank you. I just uh, wanted sure. to make sure. sure. Thank you. Thank you, Mercy. Victor. Herb, and, and I think we all have, I think they made copies. I, I know we received an email from you. Uh -huh. um, the highly effective commission. Mm -hmm. uh, but to, to, to the point, and I'm going just to practice number five. Okay. Uh, provide stability, just to kind of like talk about 
sure. in a roundabout way of, of what you're speaking of. Mm -hmm. and, and to me, it's, it provides stability of, di of, stability of direction. And, and I go to the third bullet point. Make the, when it comes to whatever growth it is, make decisions in the context of the long-term best interest of the city as a whole. Mm -hmm. And I think that's where we should always stay. Mm -hmm. is, is it challenging at times? Because sometimes sure. things become very close and emotional. Mm -hmm. But I think without getting into details, I, I think for the most part, that's where we should be, realizing that while we're here representing districts, mm -hmm. decisions that we make are not just affecting District 5, are affecting, right. affecting the city as a whole. And, and I think if, if we can have that mindset, by the way, thank you for this. I, I, I think this is very, um, very intriguing um, to see some of the, the bullet points and views here. Uh, but as you were speaking, that's what I'm thinking, you know, just making decisions in the context of the long term and how it affects not just my neighbor, mm -hmm. uh, but the neighbor that I probably don't even see. Mm -hmm. So that, that's how I would try to frame this conversation. Okay. Uh, thank you, Victor. And that is, that is a great framing. And I think, uh, I think that is your responsibility, actually, because as the director of a municipal corporation, what's in the best of the whole city in the long term? Now, you obviously may come to different conclusions about that, and, and you should at times, uh, and you should have that discussion, but have it in the discussion of, I think this is in the best interest of the city for this reason. Somebody else can say, yeah, I disagree for this reason, and then you're off to it. Anita? Well, I hear it frequently. Mm -hmm. uh, I recently had somebody reach out from, I'll say Georgia, mm -hmm. and he says, hey, what, what housing do you have in Deltona? Mm -hmm. I don't want a big house. Right. I just need something. My wife and I. What, what apartments do you have? What condos do you have? Mm -hmm. What? Uh, uh, mm -hmm. Yeah, we don't. Okay. No, was was you know my opinion. I'm bringing in. We need to bring in the diversity of housing. Oh. We need to have mm -hmm. the condos, the um, multifamily units, mm -hmm. and those into the city. You know, recently our neighboring cities, they recognized it as well. And now they have mm -hmm. substantially increased mm -hmm. um, their housing and their residents as well. What I heard when, when Deltona started getting on track was from a uh, local city commissioner said, wow, Deltona's starting to get it together. We're in trouble. <laughs> I said, what do you mean? He goes, we count on your residents to come to our city, mm -hmm. and when you get it together, where's our customers gonna come from? So now we have to change our focus from having the restaurants and having all this to we need to create residents. Mm -hmm. um, so one way they've done that, they said, well, we don't have a lot of land. So how do they do it? They're creating the multi-housing units, mm -hmm. and they're filling that market Mm -hmm. very, very quickly. Mm -hmm. um, so that is a market that is needed in our area is the diversification mm -hmm. of that. So one value for you as you think about growth is how do we provide housing diversity? Because there are obviously a lot of diversity of markets. Not everybody wants to live in a single family home uh, or not everybody can afford to. Uh, and if you look at vibrant cities, there's a pretty diverse set of housing there. You know, you have a lot of I choices. I think that know, goes so. back to our gallery. Okay. All right. Lauren, do you have a comment? No, I, I was, I'm, I'm just taking it in right now. Okay. But I, I will say, I, I think that the city is moving in the direction of diversity. But we have to, we have to think smart. Mm hmm And, and. Thinking smart means that we are diverse across the board. In other okay. words, we've got plenty of room for people that want a 10 acre ranch or a five acre ranch mm -hmm. or a two and a half acre piece sure. of property. And we have small uh, size lots mm -hmm. um, that people just want a big house and mm -hmm. they don't want to take no care yard. of their property. Mm -hmm. So, you know, what we've, what we've, created or what we are creating now is diversity on one end but not on the other end okay we're giving up stuff on one end okay to have diversity over here yeah. okay. and and we've all agreed that that you know it needs to be good for all 
Uh, and if it is good for all, then we need to maintain that. Mm -hmm. um, and I'm, I'm on board. I, we do have to have um, other housing besides our single family homes. Um, we do need to have um, some uh, apartment housing and, and multiple family housing. We do need those things. But don't forget that right up here behind um, Publix now, we've got more multifamily homes going in up there. Um, and that whole area up there, if, you, if you've ever been up there or drive around here, it's all duplexes and apartments um, behind that, the Lowe's Plaza, Publix Plaza. So if we go back to the villages imagery, there are villages that are intense, high-rise, multifamily type stuff. Mm -hmm. There are villages that are rural, in essence. Mm -hmm. uh, and that would be consistent with what you're saying. Yes. You want to protect that full range of diversity. So there's some folks exactly. who have five acre tracks, yeah. you know, that's their lifestyle. Right. And other folks want to be in an apartment right. or a condo. So I just think that we need to be smart okay. in, 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 our, in our development of residential land. Um, and I think we need to, you know, consider the, the environment and everything else that goes okay. on with that. Okay. We claim to be um, so eco-friendly and we, we've got, you know, bike trails and we've got walking trails and, we, and we've got all these parks and we've got all this really wonderful stuff that's all um, eco-minded, if you will. Um, we have to be careful that when we have situations um, that we that we take those things into consideration. On one hand, because it, when people look at us, they shouldn't look at us and be confused about who we are and what we're doing. Mm -hmm. They need to know that we're here and, and we're thinking of them, we're thinking about doing the right thing for the city. We know there's a balance there that has to happen. Um, but it, it's, it's confusing, I think, when, when the city puts out face masks and shirts to promote our eco-friendly system, and then we tear apart property. Okay. Uh, or we use it in a way that is... Seems inconsistent with the message. Inconsistent with, with the message that we're trying to send okay. out. Okay. I think we need to think about those kind of things, too, as okay. we continue to move forward. Okay. But I think that instead of looking at so many, because like I said earlier, we've got housing that's gonna meet us till we're, we're over the mark, mm -hmm. uh, all the way up to 2035. But multiple family mm -hmm. homes and, 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 and those kind of uh, developments, we do have some, we can't say we don't have any, but we should certainly use more of that. Okay. Right. And we need to find those places where, where they're gonna fit in to our city in a proper manner. So okay. I'll just, just throwing that out there. I'm, okay, all right. I don't want to run on. So. Okay, all right, but Other if we go back to the early discussion about branding, you've, you've got a brand and you want to ensure all your actions are consistent with that brand. And that's, that's tricky, <laughs> you it, know. It, and it's interesting you say that. Oh, some of us. Uh, go Dave first, please, no yeah, bigger. That's fine. Yeah, I also agree. You know, when I was campaigning, I was talking to a lot of people. A lot of people were opposed to the overdevelopment of houses. Mm -hmm. they, they say we have too many, especially the small 40 by 80, 80 lots, yeah. lots or mm -hmm. 105 lots. Um, but I did run into some people. Some people were pro, mm -hmm. um, you know, apartments, and some people were against them. And I, I think it was about a 50-50 mix. I know we do have some apartments here in Deltona, and I, I believe we got what 500 units coming pretty soon over off of Normandy. It's actually more than that, but more it's just that. in discussion at this point. Just in this, so we we do have a diversity okay. of right. property coming, and, and you know, piggybacking on what Lauren said, um, we, we do need to keep our diversity because. We can't convert everything we have, let's say that's large acreage, into RPUDs. You mm -hmm. know, we, we need to maintain a balance of, you know, 
we got RPUDs, we got acreage, we have, you know, some apartments. I think we need to keep that and just okay. not cluster everything into one. Okay. So. All right. Thanks. Very good. I guess I'm just going to go go back to and very valid points, but I think it comes back to framing and perspective. Okay. Um, so and, borrow from John and frame it for us. <laughs> and, 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 and I know it's a tricky situation that we're in. Don't forget my pallet one too, because I think that <laughs> applies here. <laughs> but, but I think you're, you're right, but I think framing right now, I, I think it's the challenge that we have in, okay. in, in how we perceive or how we present. Um, because that, that mindset of not in my backyard becomes mm -hmm. that type of reality, which in my day job, working with something else, um, encountered, um, City of Orlando has a, a, a group called Jimby, Jimby, however you want to pronounce that, yeah. and pretty much is yes in my backyard. Mm -hmm. um, so they flipped it around. Not necessarily not in my backyard, yes in my backyard, and this is why we want it, this is why we should have it. Mm -hmm. But I just think, it's about framing and how we do that. So in one way, we're saying one thing, I hear you, King, and then in the other way, but I, one should not take away from the other. I am still gonna be an advocate and promote the heck out of our ecosystem parks and our trails and things like that. I do know that we have some growth coming and there's possibility of that being part of it. Um, but that should not take away from the fact of what we got going on. And I'm use that word hybrid. It's, it's trying to find that middle ground, which is difficult. Um, where, you know, it's kind of like having the best of both worlds um, and not being an extreme to either side um, because we are growing. Um, the train is coming. Mm -hmm. I, I always like to use that analogy, whether we like it or not, the train is coming. Um, so what do we do? We sit down and I'm gonna go back to the businesses. Do we sit down years ago like we did and let Orange City take all our businesses? Mm -hmm. And now we're saying, hello, Deltona, where are the businesses? Or do we realize that that train is coming and we need to create and be creative, uh, not go to an extreme, but be creative in providing that train stop so that we can benefit. When I say we, the city, our residents can benefit from some of these things. So it's tricky. But I think um, that's the challenge, and that's why we sit where we sit. Okay, but what I hear you saying is one criteria, at least, regardless of the project, is to look at it, and what is this thing going to mean 20 years from now? Yes. Is, is this going to be a boon to our community? Are we creating something that's going to be a down? <laughs> you know, and it's not just what's going to happen right now, but what's the implication of this? And does it put us in a better position <laughs> to reach all well, this vision? And, and if I can use the neighborhood Walmart off of Saxon, when that was first coming in, nobody wanted. Everybody talked about the crime that was coming in, the traffic that was coming in, A, B, C, and D. Uh -huh. The same folks that were challenging are the same folks that are enjoying it. Uh -huh. So sometimes we have to have that perspective or view of, it's not always as ugly as it seems to be. Um, are we gonna have challenges? Absolutely. Crime, crime is always gonna be crime. But just thinking real quickly about that, the neighborhood of Walmart, and now it's, it's, it's an area that's, that's busy. Mm -hmm. uh, you have other uh, businesses there in the area in that shopping center, um, and people are enjoying it because guess what? They don't have to travel all the way to Orange City. They can just walk across the street and go to Walmart. Mm -hmm. So uh, again, it's putting things into perspective and not thinking about the right now, mm -hmm. uh, because that's always gonna be a challenge. It's mm -hmm. how can we get over this hump mm -hmm. so that people realize, I'm gonna use Amazon. Mm -hmm. People complain about Amazon coming in. First, we wanted jobs. Oh, now we have, no, those are not well-paying jobs. The traffic that it's gonna bring. Okay, so we might have, John, maybe one or two trucks that go the opposite way that they shouldn't go. We can't control that, but let's look at the benefit mm -hmm. and some of the jobs that has provided, at least for some of our people. Okay. Um, so I think in, in, in growth is, is not the now, three, four, five years from now. But another part of what you said is there, there's a cost benefit analysis y'all have to do. Uh, and, and often we get caught up in the short term or immediate cost benefits. What we also need to be doing is what are the longer term benefits and cost, uh, and, and obviously you can be wrong about that, but at least you try to use that framework to talk about it. Thank you. So 
I'm speaking in District 3 and um, being one of the oldest communities as I campaign and even still now, I have residents who have been living there for since Deltona was discovered and they really want to stay in Deltona but they mm -hmm. can't stay at the home that they have because okay. it's too big too to make money. Okay. Um, so they have nowhere to go okay. because there, we have no 55 and over communities Please. here. Um, in District 3, we have Lakeshore Drive, which has the condos, which had I known what I know today, I probably would have purchased two of them back then. <laughs> um, because when I... Wish, uh, all of them, I'll share with you wish you'd bought all that vacant parcel years ago. I tell you, I went there acre, I yeah. went there back then the days and they were going for 40, 45. <laughs> now they're going for over 120. Um, but they're beautiful. They're upgraded and yeah. everything. So it's hard to get an apartment there mm -hmm. or a condo. Okay. You know, it's full. We have two sections. Mm -hmm. um, and then I have on Bell Tower, there's also, uh, a condo, you know, condo, condominiums, I think it's two floors, mostly um, 55 and over. Mm -hmm. You can't get an apartment there. Okay. Uh -huh. And people are asking me, you know, where are the 55 and over? So okay. I think that we will benefit uh, from you More know, housing houses work like work that. Work. I don't. I don't think there is much space in the district three um, to build anything like that right now. But um, I think they'll be welcome, um, and not only for 55 and over, but we have youth, you, you know, young people that don't want a house. Huh. Mm -hmm. And that goes back to I, some of our commissioners here who make comments. Everybody's moving into the other neighborhood uh, cities because they have apartments. Um, so Deltona can use 55 and over. We can use mm -hmm. one or two story, uh, three story apartment mm -hmm. houses okay. um, to bring in, you know, okay. uh, to offer, well, I'm not gonna say bring in, I don't get in trouble, but to offer the community and even those who currently exist here. I have half an acre mm -hmm. and I can't wait to get out of it. Yeah. Um, because of the maintenance and stuff sure. like that. So, you know, it's just just to um, mix it in okay. right. into the community. Well, part of what you're, you're recognizing as, as communities grow, change, diverse, the needs of current residents change. Uh, I did a project in Worthington, Ohio, and that was one of their big things. They're an older historic community, but the senior folks just didn't want those two or three story houses where you gotta go up and down mm -hmm. steps because it's one of those hilly communities. And so trying to fit that needs, even as people, residents change, is an important factor so, in housing diversity. It's an education process that goes back to when we have new developments, new businesses, new residences, new residential areas, whether it's in, in new commercial. It's a, a matter of education on the part of the residents, working with the local residents and, and helping them understand, as Victor was saying, the good, the bad, and the ugly. Mm -hmm. uh, when Halifax was coming in, I was under the pleasure of uh, getting a lot of rash. That's, there's, there's no other way to say it on not in my backyard. I don't want this. I don't want this, you know, what's, what's, what's going to happen? And I think that is the number one thing that residents, that causes the anxiety is, what is this going to cause me? Mm -hmm. How would, you know, they see the negative effects on how it affects them, and then that goes and it starts to escalate mm -hmm. to that anxiety of point of, this is bad, this is bad, so let's stop this. So I, honestly, I received a rash during the Halifax clearing. Um, it was not unnormal to open my email and get messages mm -hmm. that they're clearing too close to my land. Mm -hmm. I hear these tractors, I hear this. And it would be a matter of calming them down and letting them see the benefits of it. But this all goes to that education and the um, community, Outreach, I don't know what we would call it, but when we have something as this going on, um, we got to be able to communicate with the residents and get back to them so they kind of understand what to understand. Does that make sense? Mm -hmm. We recently had it go on in another neighborhood as well where it's all fine and dandy and when it was approved, but when the tractors start moving in, they don't even know what to expect. Mm -hmm. 
they don't understand that the short term, yes, you're going to hear rolling, you're going to have dust, it's going to be bad, but here's your long-term benefits. Let's okay. just get through this, and let's look at the bright side. Okay. Let's look at what's going to come. And these same residents now, I guarantee they're more than ecstatic okay. because they see, wow, look what the hospital brought. Mm -hmm. Look okay. what we have come in now. But when it's in the time, mm -hmm. it's bad. Okay. It's anxiety. That's kind of what I feel when we have something coming in. There is a moment of anxiety because they don't know what to sure. expect. Sure. So I don't know what that, that I think goes back to when, if there's any way we can have staff come up with something. So what do residents need to expect when we have a development, we have a business or we have something coming near them that we can prepare them for and then also let them see at the end, this is what you're gonna see. This is the end result. So it comes with us in that community engagement uh -huh. and community preparation. Sort of that proactive outreach. Proactive as, outreach. As, rather than waiting for folks to hear yep. and start fussing at you, mm -hmm. go out and say, and, and explain the whole process. And then, you know, I think illustrations like your Walmart are great. Yeah, this is, this is a hassle for a year, however long it takes, but look what you'll get here at the end, you know, and look over here in this side of the community, this is what we got, <laughs> you know. Yeah, I think that's, that, that sort of proactive outreach is a, an excellent strategy for dealing with this, you know, because it's going to come, so you might as well deal with it early as you can. So, Heidi? So, I look at, at growth from several different aspects, and okay. the first aspect is what drives the growth. Okay. And we live in a state that, whether you like it or not, there's over 1,000 people a day moving to this state. Mm -hmm. It's not going to stop you have an influx into the state of Florida, and we're not the only city that has growth issues. Am I correct? Almost every city has, unless they're completely built out like a city like South Daytona, who's completely landlocked, they have to go up or they have to diversify their commercial and hope to increase their tax base that way. In, in and, my little city, we had 450 housing permits in one month. We're 5,000 people. Mm -hmm. I mean, that's just overwhelming. It's phenomenal. <laughs> yeah. It's unbelievable. So you look at what drives growth, and the influx of people to the state is, uh, is one driver. The other driver is the um, mentality of the state government, and the mentality mm -hmm. of the state government is open for business. Mm -hmm. Come to Florida. There's a consistent advertising campaign done in the winters in New York mm -hmm. and Wisconsin and Minnesota and Illinois with promotions for the state of Florida. So let's be realistic. They, the state is promoting this influx mm -hmm. of people. Mm -hmm. Aside from the fact that we have no state income tax, which is another big driver for people to come down here, and we have great weather. You know, we have 11 years of baby boomer retirement. We're only on year two. You have nine more years of baby boomers retiring, and they're coming to the South, especially a state like Florida, simply because of what we're doing. So the reality is the state is promoting an influx and open for business and bringing people here and the natural, especially with the pandemic and everything else, people are coming here. Those are your growth drivers. So when you have growth drivers, you have to look at what your results are gonna be. We're open, please come. Okay, now we have people, we have to deal with it. The other, other side, the next thing that I look at is property owner's rights. And you have property owner's rights for people, whether it's commercial or residential development. And again, a lot of this is driven by the state of Florida and what the state allows property owners to do and what the, as you trickle down, what the state allows a, a city and a county to have control over. And then you look at economic development and how you make your city viable with growth economically and residentially. Mm -hmm. And the reality is because the comments have been, well, you only think about the money, you're only looking about expanding your tax base, you don't care what's already here. But the re reality is if you don't grow, you have two choices. And I'm fine with either choice. Personally, I'm a tree hugger, I love all that. Hurts me to see land taken down, whether it's the, the infill lot or something else. So if you, you have to decide, that this, this, the commission itself has to decide for the future of Deltona which way you wanna go. 
And do you want to be uh, a city that grows and, and the diversity of housing? I totally agree. We have no apartment complexes here that are viable for young people that would work at Amazon or middle-aged people. There's just no transient housing here. We're a city that's become about 30% rentals, and we have no rental controls over that um, in terms of policy or anything. That's a big factor that we have to look at. Do you want to continue to have a free-for-all in your rent base and then not have any apartment houses? The apartment houses that we have are also um, very economically limited in terms of where they're located and, and what your crime rate is there and what your turnover rate is there and what your subsidy is there from the government and so forth. A lot of those are subsidized housing. So then again, you limit what's going to go in there when you have subsidized housing factors. So all those things you have to take a look at. Um, and the big thing that I think Deltona, where Deltona has missed the boat, and we can correct this, is um, the fact that we have leverage. The city and the commission have leverage over how this city can be developed. Anita, I think it was you that pointed out before, we have three I-4 exits. That's huge. Three Interstate 4 exits. What other city has that? And we have, we can benefit off of our logistics and our location, and we can write the narrative, provided we understand that we value ourselves. For me, if there's a gas station, there's a, there's a spot where a Wawa was gonna go in on the corner of Saxon and Normandy off of, off of the Saxon interchange. For me, I know that was on hold for a while. My, the developer put the Wawa by, by the hospital. When that comes in, the city should be leveraging with the developer and with the county. That intersection needs improvements. You need street lighting there. You need sidewalks there. You need to make that safe for the community there. We have that power because the driver for economic development, I'm sorry I didn't go back to that, is demographics, and when a business wants to come in there, and, and please correct me if I'm wrong, they're looking at the profit that they can make there. They're not looking at the hard cost of the building. That hard cost of the building, to a degree, is a fixed cost. That's gonna be, that fixed cost is gonna be there whether they go in Deltona, in Orange City, they go to DeLand, they go to Daytona, it does not matter. The fixed cost of the building and the land is within a certain range they're gonna put it there. Uh-oh, he's putting his thing up. Am I saying something wrong? No, ma'am, I was just gonna expand on it. Okay, so I was afraid he was gonna say, no, Heidi, that's completely wrong. So anyway, um, we have to learn as a board that we can ask for things. We shouldn't be afraid that that Wawa, for example, or another business is not going to come if we ask for those improvements, if we do that to improve our city. We have that capability, and we've always been like the bridesmaid desperate to get married. Okay, so we got to have it. Before I go to John, so I mean, what you're really saying is you want to change the frame here. And as we look at growth, how can we require that growth that improves the quality of our city uh, and you get it? There's a little town in Massachusetts, very historic town. The McDonald's, you really got to look to find the M. You know, it looks just like every little historic building in that town. And, and, you know, if you put your foot down, they'll do it if the market's there. If they want to be there, they'll play by your game. <laughs> and know? I just want to make one, one more quick point. Sure. To, the, to the point of, of housing growth and development in general when it comes to residential, as you know, I work in another city and a conversation came up with one of my clients and they were talking about a development that went in maybe five years ago. And now the people that live in that development were all opposed to another development. And they were all saying, well, we don't want that. And I, I honestly know the first one, I don't know what they were opposed to, the second one, I don't remember. And my client looked at him and said, so you've been here two years and you're opposed to that development? She goes, we didn't want you here. 
<laughs> we didn't want you here. We didn't want your development. So it's a cycle. Mm -hmm. It's a cycle. The person that moved into the development that other people didn't want is now saying, we don't want that development. It's human nature. Mm -hmm. So. John. If I can expand on a couple of things. Um, you've already indicated that we need to have some workshops involving economic development. And I'm going to give you a little bit of a taste of why. Uh, we always talk about all the commercial it's in Orange City. Um, the driver of that is uh, socioeconomic. Uh, for instance, the one place I want is I want a Panda Express. Uh, Panda Express requires a median income of $60,000 in a three mile area. Well, if you look at West Pollution, the only place they can go is in the area between veterans and Sasson because they pull in Summer Haven, Sasson Wood, the Berry Golf and Country Club, and Glen Abbey, and that will get the socioeconomic above 60000 If you look at Deltona, your neighborhood is about the only place that would drive it. Unfortunately, right across I-4 is an RV park that drives your average down. And so, you know, we can sit here and say that we want village centers, but until we get those socioeconomics up, it's going to be hard to get the national companies in. Mom and pop restaurants and stuff, yes. But every one of these companies has a standard. For instance, I, I remember this Crate and Barrel. You had, to have, you had to have a million people within a certain distance with an income over X. They did put one finally at Mall Millennia and it went under. Um, William Sonoma, similar. Darden restaurants, pretty high. Um, you don't see very many Darden restaurants go under because those numbers have been shown to drive their businesses. So when we want a village center, we need to be looking at that. Second thing, the Wawa example. On Saxon, we have undersized lots that unless we have a program to start purchasing and assembling lots into something that's usable, they're going to stay the way they are. So one of the things that we would likely bring to you all is a program where we will set aside a certain dollar amount, even on Deltona Boulevard, where we will assemble residential lots that should be commercial, raise them, put two or three lots together to get something big enough for a doctor's office or a lawyer's office or something that we would find desirable. And then we would sell it, put the money back into the fund, and just go down the road that way. But if you look at Saxon, you also don't have sewer. Uh, that's a problem over there. You know, we have a plan to get the sewer over in that area of Saxon. Uh, so, um, you know, one of the things that Jerry Mays is working on is assembling a list of commercial areas. You know, are the lots sufficient? Check the box. If they're utility, check the box. And if the zoning proper, check the box. Got those three things. We're ready to move. Any deficiency, we need to have a program to deal with the deficiency. So, um, but I just want to point out that you know, when we're talking about development as a whole, it's a very complex do. Um, you know, you, you make a stew, you kind of throw everything out of the refrigerator. But, you know, in order to make a good stew, it's got to work together. If we want village centers, when we're doing, you know, economic development, or residential and what have you, we need to be thinking about what the impact of that would have on a potential village center. I can tell you right now, and one of the things we really need to do it's a very thorough market analysis because the real estate trend is changing. The subdivision I live in, people are getting to be my age and older. 
They want to downsize. The kids are gone. There's not a whole lot of opportunity for people in a nice neighborhood to downsize to another nice neighborhood. You gave the example, condos or something like that, something where you don't have to mow the yard anymore. There's not a whole lot of those out there. And uh, then maybe that's a market, if we can do a market analysis of, of West Volusia, not just Deltona, and find what market we need to try to address with our palette. Not our frame, not our canvas, but our palette. Let, let me point out the important thing that he just said. That's a very proactive approach to determining the type of development you want, where you're saying, here's what we want, as opposed to other folks saying, I want to give you this. And, and that's a really critical step, John. Victor. And I'm going to jump on your, on your Stuman mindset. <laughs> uh, and we haven't mentioned it here, <laughs> but I think it goes through the process as well. Because remember, a lot of these things happen prior to then even coming to us in the commission. So I think two other groups that we should be making sure that we're in the same page, not necessarily because I, I, I hear this all the time, even from us on the dais. Well, the PNZ, CRA. Well, the PNZ said this, we should do this. And I think we have to make sure that every process knows their responsibility to be able to help in the whole growth of it. Because sometimes a business comes into the PNZ for A, the PNZ is voting on B and C when it's A that we should be looking at. And then by the time it comes to us that we're voting on A, people are still having conversation about B and C. Mm -hmm. So when we talk about businesses not wanting to be here, just think about how we're misleading them. So I, I think it's definitely on John's shoulder uh, to be able to make sure that this, this process, uh, it's, it's felt throughout. Uh, because at the end of the day, it's coming to us, yes. But we need to have a PNZ, and we need to have a CRA that it's, it's understanding their function so that we can definitely work together. We're gonna have some differences? Absolutely, that's part of it. But we should not be having differences when I'm coming in for A, but you're judging me on B, and then when you come to the commission, it's like we're in a corner. Well, we can't talk about B. We have to talk about A first, and, and I think if we can get a better understanding of that process, it's just gonna help everyone. But let me build upon that, but also what you want, you want PZZ, CRA, et cetera, to understand the vision. <laughs> you know, and that they are hopefully supportive of that vision, <laughs> you know, because they're your appointees. So it's that, cool. Can Anita talk? Did you want to say something before yeah, you, you go? You gotta leave, yeah. Yeah, yeah I did, and, and I do apologize. I have a prior commitment today for some, for one of the local schools. Um, but there's been several neighbors, even in my neighborhood, that I don't want the community, the seniors, because if you, if, if you think about it, the seniors now, what are they hearing? Oh, well, Deltona is no longer a senior community. And I think that senior community is Ormond and, you know, some other areas. And some comments have been, you don't have a place for us anymore. Mm -hmm. You know, one of the things that Delian has done is they have made that 50 plus community. Mm -hmm. <sighs> Please, let's make it 60 plus. I don't want to be in that senior <laughs> community. Okay. <laughs> Let's just call it a senior community. They've made that senior community, and encompassed in that community is homeowners association fees. I don't like him anymore. <laughs> He's right behind me, though. Um, they're lawns mode, because, you know, as we get a little bit older, it's, it's hotter, it's harder. You know, they don't want to mow lawn. They don't want to do this. They don't want to do that. They want the community pool. They want an all-encompassed, this is my forever home, mm -hmm. and they're moving now out of Deltona to these neighboring communities to be where they are being coddled as seniors now. I don't want our seniors to feel that the Gotta youth, leave. the younger generation is taking them over and pushing them out. And in order for us to do that, we do need to be proactive, because if we want to keep these residents here and keep them happy, we need to have that diversity. Mm -hmm. Okay. And and that is that is very important because it's not that I don't want to be a senior community. Mm -hmm. We just have totally evolved around it, but we haven't said, oh wow, where are we going to put them? Mm -hmm. You know, where where do they go from here? Mm -hmm. I mean, Orange City has a community home. Mm -hmm. um, I believe it's it's an I don't know if we want to call it an assisted living because it's not really a nursing home, but it's it's housing. They're they're an independent home, mm -hmm. but they still have help there. 
So we, we lose those rent ends. We lose to, you know, the homeowners association that they take care of everything. They have a community pool, they have programs. Everything is encompassing within that neighborhood and they don't have to go nowhere. They don't have to go far. Mm -hmm. And that's where we're lacking. Okay. We're, we're lacking that in that gallery. But I, I wanna thank you personally before I have to take off. You've put a lot of time, effort, staff, all of you guys, I appreciate it. I know there was times we didn't have as much engagement. It could be COVID, you know, whatever the reason. But I know, I want to say that at least you guys took the effort, and I greatly appreciate it, to do the outreach to the community and get it out there. Okay. So I want to say thank you. Thank you. So everybody have a, enjoy the last time and okay. enjoy my lunch. <laughs> <laughs> I, I, well, I got a quick question. Sure. How big were the lot sizes? when the Mackle brothers designed Deltona for a retirement community? They were third acres minimum. Were they a third acre, half acre, or a lot size? Oh no, the lot sizes in the old, in the old uh, uh, area were district, the old first, second, and third area, they were, they were a quart, less than quarter acre, Mr. Peters, correct? Because they're all on sanitary sewer. Look at and Deltona below. The they're, yeah, they're, the city lot sizes uh, in this in this city have been driven more about the, the form of sewage. If there yep. was public sewer, they tended to be smaller lot. If they were on septic, they tended to be you know, third of an acre to a half acre lots. Um, so when you look around the city and you see these larger lots, I can almost 100% guarantee you it because they left septic and that was the minimum size lot for a septic system. Okay. In the smaller, in the area where you see the smaller lot, you have public sewer. So, you know, the lot sizes in the city in the past have been driven by uh, the availability of water and sewer. And uh, you're seeing the same trend now. If there's sewer available, they tend to go with smaller lot hmm. because they have an investment in that utility. Okay, thank you. And can I just ask, is, is the, because most of the lots in Daltona, like where, where I live and all the infill lots and everything are all quarter acre and they're all on septic. And those were the build, those were the ones that the Mackle brothers didn't do initially, correct? That's, and then the infrastructure stopped after they created those first three pockets. I'm not sure what Mackle brothers did and didn't do, but the simple answer to your question is if they're quarter an acre or larger, Almost 100% on septic. Okay, thank you. Okay. All right. okay. Any other comments on growth management? I'd like to turn to the topic of uh, social supports. Uh, one of the concerns I've heard expressed is, you know, you're a large community. You have, as any large community, you have folks who have uh, addiction issues. You have uh, homelessness some, to some degree. Uh, you have mental health issues. Uh, and the question is, uh, you know, how does the community respond to it and what's the role of city government in that? Uh, you know, we have a, a fairly structured national thing. The feds are responsible for certain things. The state's responsible for certain things like they're responsible for child abuse and neglect. Counties have a role. Some of it's they have to match mental health funding and, the, and all counties have a fairly large de Department of Social Services. Uh, because of, that's part of their responsibilities. Cities are very different about that. It's a lot more variation. Uh, you know, if you're an intertitlement city, you get CDBG money, et cetera. That's federal dollars directed toward community improvements. Uh, very few cities actually have departments of social services. Uh, and if you find them, you find them probably more in South Florida for some reason. Uh, one, it's a budgetary issue. Uh, there's you know, you're struggling to provide the services you got to provide. That's not one you're required. Um, but, you know, clearly this is a community need. I just uh, even if we're not specifically talking about the role of city government, what do you hope would happen here? What do you think needs to occur? Uh, how do you, can you see the community responding to that and providing some, some leadership? So can you just talk to me about that? Where's it? Thank you. So I, I understand that um, there's been a lot of talk about bringing social services to mm -hmm. the city of Deltona. Mm -hmm. I think a few years ago, um, I, it was um, Chief Schneider who put together the first social service meeting that we ever had 
here in the city of Daltona, it was standing room only, and mm -hmm. we came to discover organizations that we didn't even know existed. Mm -hmm. Mm -hmm. I think the fire department currently has a guide that lists um, all those organizations, although I, I believe they're being also updated mm -hmm. as we speak. Mm -hmm. um, and um, I know that we have uh, Stuart Marshman, who mm -hmm. oh, supports yeah. our mm -hmm. community. Um, and here again, Stuart Marchman was an, uh, an organization that looked to Deltona to build and um, was voted out um, to give service to the uh, residents in Deltona. And I, we have we have had a lot of different organizations, nonprofit. Mm -hmm. I believe that right now we have New Hope Services, which is here in Deltona mm -hmm. in, in Commissioner King's district, uh, Lake Helen Osteen. Um, and, and they provide uh, utilities, rental assistance. Um, they have a food drive twice mm -hmm. a month. They also um, have emergency vouchers for uh, housing and stuff like that. And here, right here in our building, we have Healthy Star Coalition, mm -hmm. which offers assistance to uh, mm -hmm. you know women who have sure. been uh, pregnant, women recovering, and help for their their babies. So I think that we have services of our. I think people are not aware of them. Okay. And what they're aware of is the ones that are far from Deltona, the neighborhood center, because it's always so publicized. Mm -hmm. um, we have other organizations um, in in the land and Daytona Beach that you know that our residents reach out to. Mm -hmm. Here again, I think is making aware our residents mm -hmm. aware of what we have in Deltona. Mm -hmm. um, New Hope Services gets bombarded with, mm -hmm. with you know, not in a bad way. Yeah. I'm just saying that's how, a lot, a lot of how good they are mm -hmm. in servicing the community. And I know that I hear a lot of comments, we need to bring this and bring that, but I think that we, instead of reinventing the wheel, I think we need to make what we currently have okay. stronger okay. Um, so that they, it can service more. It's right here in the city of Deltona. Mm -hmm. They don't need to go far. Mm -hmm. um, and and I, I you know this is this is my um, my belief of what we have currently. Let's use what we have okay. and make it stronger um, okay. and, and go from there. Okay. Right. And that's one way of looking at our social services here in okay. Deltona. And it's you know they get grants. They not only do they get grants from the city of Deltona, but they get county, they get mm -hmm. state grants. Mm -hmm. So it's not like an organization that's looking just to live out of the city of Deltona's okay. funds. Okay. So, that's okay. Okay. Yeah, I, I, I have to agree. I, I don't think it's the government, the city government's job to mm -hmm. put a social service program within, mm -hmm. you know, let's say city hall. Right. Um, we do have a lot of nonprofits and that's why they are nonprofits mm -hmm. are to assist with these types of services. Now, where I think the city could do a better job is to be piggyback on what Maritza said, it's not a peep, a, a lot of people don't know about these. Cause I know yeah. I had somebody email me the other day looking for some guidance. I actually had to reach out to, you know, a resident that I knew knew about this and she gave me the information. Um, so I think what we probably need as a city is, is not to have our own little center here, but to have somebody as a liaison mm -hmm. between the community and the social services programs that are already available. I, I think that's where the city needs to step in. Okay. And you know, if we have somebody that's over here working the desk or something, mm -hmm. maybe if we have some type of after hours number or something, even if it's a recorded mes message, you know, to direct people to the right sources okay. would, would be more beneficial. Okay. So a communication okay. role. Yes. Facilitation okay. networks. Absolutely, more communication as opposed to hands-on. Okay. And to add also um, to this comment, I had a meeting yesterday. Uh, we're planning a hurricane awareness, mm -hmm. which we have every year. We ha we didn't have it last year because of the pandemic, but we, uh, the fire department and, and our, our staff is bringing it back. And one of the things that we discussed was to um, use what the fire department currently has as a guide mm -hmm. for all the different social services within uh, West Volusia mm -hmm. or in South Volusia and make it available to our residents up front. And every, you know, here we have 
when we have the uh, the, set, the town hall meeting for that. Mm -hmm. And until we can upgrade, at least we'll give them something to start off with. Mm -hmm. So they will be making those uh, flyers available, uh, which is, Good. you know, a, it's really a, a nice big one. Um, and, and let the people know where they can go. Uh, again, it needs to be upgraded, but at least they'll have something to work with. Okay. If, if, if I can just okay. jump in, and I think the mayor mentioned this the last time, the city of Deltona gives out the most percentage out of their CDBG fund, 15%. That's the highest, and we give the highest. Am I correct? 15% of our CDBG funding goes to social services. Okay. It's great to hear, yes, I, I, I think no, government should not be involved in social services. That's why we have this 15% that we give to nonprofits to do this. I think the challenge then also becomes going back to, you mentioned homelessness. I don't know that we really have a homelessness problem here in the city of Deltona. Does that mean we might not have one or two homeless? Absolutely. But again, it goes back to, sorry, John, framing. <laughs> No, honestly. Be sorry to use that term for yes. you. They'll never leave well, but, but no, but I, I, again, it, it goes back to that, honestly, because sure. then you have people using that. Oh, no, we have a homelessness problem. Where, where is it? You know, because when we've done certain things, yes, we have some challenges, but isn't it overall that now all of a sudden we're, we're talking about, and I know in, in some of the social service summits that we've had, it's even something about family, a family, because... We don't have shelters for families. Mm -hmm. So then that becomes a challenge. Uh, but do we have a homelessness problem? I don't know. Mm -hmm. But the fact that we are, there's a lot of nonprofits who are not in the city of Deltona, mm -hmm. who are trying to get an office in the city of Deltona because they want to tap that 15%. Let's just be honest about it. Okay. So that's another challenge that we have. Mm -hmm. A lot of other agencies want to do, have an office because obviously we want to be able to use our CDBG funding to be able to help our residents. Mm -hmm. um, so folks are, oh, I have, a, I have an office in your city, therefore I wanna provide this service. Mm -hmm. and, and, and I think it becomes a challenge, but I think we have some agencies, you mentioned one, uh, New Hope Service, we also work with the Neighborhood Center, um, that I think these are agencies equipped to be able to do that. Mm -hmm. And as long as we can maintain, be able to maintain to fund as we can um, and, and help, and, and yes, it's, it's market, let's help, let's have an information piece so that people know, two, two, one, so simple, but some of us don't wanna use it. It just becomes like, I'm gonna create an agency or I'm gonna I'm create a nonprofit because we have this challenge. And then we have so many multiple nonprofits that it dilutes where the money is going. And, and, and to me, that's the challenge sometimes with our CDB funding. You know, if we have one or two agencies that are doing a great job, let's keep funding them. You know, I, I'm not saying let's have a, let them have a monopoly, but when you start having two or three agencies or doing the same thing, all we're doing is diluting the process mm -hmm. and those same individuals, you know what they're doing? Mm -hmm. They're picking up on that and they're going different places mm -hmm. to get. Same thing when we had the rental assistant, right? The county opened it for the city of Deltona. Well, guess what? You had some folks, well, I'm gonna take from the city of Deltona, then I'm gonna go to the county, take from the county. So, you know, it, it dilutes everything. I, social service is gonna be social services and we're gonna always have challenges. Um, but I think as a city, we're doing the best we can in providing as much funding mm -hmm. as we can okay. for this. Okay. Right. Lauren, any comments? I have a comment and, and, and it's sure. really, I wanna just say, talking about the homeless, you know, our fire department does so much mm -hmm. to reach out to the homeless here in the city oh, really? of Deltona. Uh, and I want to point out that this past winter, it was so cold. Um, we, myself and, and, and somebody else, dropped off, you know, quite a few winter blankets to the city of Deltona. And they couldn't even get rid of them. Mm. Um, so when they questioned, what do we do with them? We said, well, then take them to the homeless shelter. You know, so we were we were prepared, mm -hmm. went around. They refused help. They refused to be picked up and taken somewhere. So I gotta, you know, give it to the fire department here in the city of Deltona. They really, really prepare themselves for this time of the work season, and they really do a lot, you know, for the homeless to try to help. So, okay. you know, and I think we also uh, donate to the homeless shelter in Daytona Beach, right? I don't, in Deland, I'm sorry, Deland. Deland. Neighborhood Center, yes. We have a capital capital financial program there and also uh, CDBG money. Okay. Mayor, Mayor. Mayor. And, and I, did, oh, oh, I'm sorry. No, I no. just, oh, no, I just go, wanted go. to say that in Florida, um, counties 
provide social services. And every taxpayer, so if you live in the city of Deltona, the portion of your taxes that you're paying to the county, you're paying for those services. And I don't think most people understand that. Mm -hmm. Or that that's why most cities don't get involved because that's part of the services that the counties provide. And when a new city incorporates, it doesn't take any of that money. The county keeps it. And, and I actually, I don't know, which city manager I was with when we went to visit the county. Was, it was Dr. Cooper and was myself. It Dr. Yes. yes, and we went us. there, and um, there is, you know, in this day and age with the tech, you would think that all of this could be handled, but it was clear when we were there that they, from the county is administering it, they didn't know if we were giving money and the county is giving money. And as I think Victor said, there's a lot of duplication, you know, so there's money that's not being used effectively. And probably it would be good to have another discussion with the county, you know, on that subject to get to the point where, you know, the dollars are being spent better. But I also think that there are people here in the city that feel that somehow the city is neglecting them um, and, you know, and not forming like a department mm -hmm. for social services. Mm -hmm. And they don't understand that there is significant money that the county has. And when we were there, the county folks were showing us how many Deltona people were actually on their list. Three hundred forty-five thousand dollars of county money went to help the city of Deltona residents in that one year. And 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 since you brought that up, and I apologize, Lauren, uh, for jumping in here. That was on my list. When we had social service summits, and those were organized by some individuals, Volusia County was never invited. Okay, so when you are doing a big picture, talk about framing, mm -hmm. talk about looking at this stuff, you have to bring everything in. Because if you leave such a significant amount of money out of your conversation, what is your narrative? It's a false narrative. It's an incomplete narrative. And when, when the three of us went there, I about fell out of my chair when I heard that amount of money that has been given to Deltona residents that was never ever made, that we as a commission were never made aware of, the public was never made aware of in those social service summits. No, and they don't know that they're paying. It's your county portion of your taxes, like it pays for your, your, your court system, it pays for your airport, it pays for, for all those things, it also pays for social services. So I'm sorry, that was part of it, but I don't have to say that now. <laughs> so, Lauren. Well, I don't have a whole lot to add to this conversation because I okay. think that we're all talking the same stuff here. Yeah. Um, I feel the same way. Um, I, I truly believe that people who need help need to get the help. Mm -hmm. um, I think that we have some people in our community who have extremely hard situations mm -hmm. um, with disabilities. And, um, and two years ago when we were looking at hurricanes and stuff coming our way, um, we put in, or uh, the mayor and um, Anita, several people put in some long, hard hours trying to help mm -hmm. certain people in the community. Um, and and, and we, you were able to do that. Um, I don't know the whole process that you guys went through to get that accomplished. But what I do believe is that that process that you went through should have been, if it wasn't recorded, so that <clears throat> when that happens again, we don't have to create something all over again. Mm -hmm. That process should be in place, and when those two 
four or five families mm -hmm. who live in the city need help, we ought to be able to go boom, 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 here it is, and, and go down that list and check it off so that they get the assistance and the help that they need. Um, it shouldn't be something new. Uh, we've already accomplished it. Um, and, and we should expect those families who are in those situations to come to us again. Uh, and they should feel welcomed to come here okay. and, and get the, that help that they got. Um, heck, after they've done it a couple times, I would think they don't need our help anymore mm -hmm. because then they've gone through the process mm -hmm. a few times mm -hmm. and, and they know what to do. Okay. Mm -hmm. um, but, you know, the county, they give us a lot of assistance and, and we do not have a good handle, honestly, on all of the services available. Uh, used to be, uh, I don't, I haven't seen it for a while, so maybe they're not doing it anymore. But it used to be that uh, the news journal, about every other month, put out a whole page in the mm. newspaper. I remember of, that. Of places to go mm -hmm. to get assistance for this, that, and the other thing. I mean, it was all there. And about every, why did they do it every other month? Because it changed. Mm -hmm. Mm -hmm. Some people, some 501 C's went out of, out of business. Uh, others uh, continued on, new ones came in. And so they were continually changing that list. Um, I know our church always grabbed a copy of that mm -hmm. when it came out because we used it mm -hmm. um, with not only our members that needed help, but the community as they needed help, um, they, they came in and asked questions and we tried to help them by using that that sheet. Um, I think that's the problem that we will face again um, with the list that the fire station has. Um, if they don't have somebody that's continually updating, updating that list, uh, half the stuff on it may be poor information. Okay. So um, um, I don't, you know, I believe that people who n honestly need help should receive help. There's no doubt about it. Um, but I also agree uh, with Victor. Um, having a food pantry at your church uh, and, and being involved in it at all, you realize that a lot of times you see the very same people over and over and over again and oh, by the way, they just came from another church and right before then they were at another church. And, and so we're helping the same people multiple times mm -hmm. all in the same month mm -hmm. because they just go from one place to the other and just take advantage of the situation. And I think that there has to be, if the city wants to move forward with some kind of a, a plan um, to help um, these folks, um, we have to have some kind of a checks and balances system uh, involved in that um, so that, so that, like we said earlier, it's good across the board. We're not just helping a few people a lot and other people that need help don't get it because all of a sudden now, like, like our uh, services that we're using, we'll be running out of funds too, okay. just like they run out of funds. We give them funds to, to operate and, and we know that sometimes that money's gone faster than we can blink our eyes okay. um, because they've got people that need it. But they have a system in place right. that says, we're going to help you here, but we can't help you over there. Mm -hmm. okay. and, and, and I think that's one of the good reasons to have somebody else doing that work. Okay. Um, so, so the direction I hear from you is, because since you stay with existing practice, work on communications to try and provide that linkage so that you can refer people to the appropriate place, and, and work on focusing your dollars, because you are, are right, 
if you try to give a little bit to everybody, it really is inconsequential. <laughs> you know, focus on where you're providing enough resources to make a difference for somebody. Yeah. And can I just make Please. two comments real quick? Um, the whole thing comes down to two things. It comes down to money and sustainability. Okay. And, and the responsibility that this board has, again, for its shareholders is how do we manage the money that we get in. And you talk about openness and transparency, and when you come down to social services, Unless you as a municipality direct X amount of dollars to a certain agency, how do you control where the money goes? You can, but it becomes a laborious process that you intend have to hire more staff right. internally to do more things um, to, to, to process that. I'm not in favor at all of the city getting in the social service business, not at all. And I'll tell you why. The, the organizations that we give that money to have to have, in order to have federal and state money, you have to have a tracking system, HMIS, mm -hmm. trapping, tracking system for homelessness. <coughs> they do the point in time count. Could be undercounted, could be not. Bottom line is the point in time count always shows a very low number for actual homelessness in the city of Deltona, not borderline in families, but actual not having, not having a home. Mm -hmm. So when you look at HMIS tracking system, mm -hmm. you have to have something like that to show where your money goes, and that's how you see how, who's double dipping and who's not in terms of receiving federal money. Mm -hmm. and, and that's really, really important because we've had this whole conversation this morning on, f on basically your budget link, linked to your strategic plan mm -hmm. and so forth, and how are, we gonna, how are we gonna fund the things that are truly important to make the city sustainable? Mm -hmm. So when you look at social services, we get money from the federal government, we do there. If, if, mm -hmm. if there's a need to supplement, we get SHIP money. But when you look at what is the responsibility of taxpayer dollars is one thing compared to what is on the private sector and the grants that the private sector chooses to get, and those nonprofits, and they are springing up like dandelions in summer. Everyone has a nonprofit, and everyone wants to tap in to the city's resources, okay? They, wanna, they want us to do the free advertising. They wanna use our parks. Okay, you wanna have a food drop at our park? Understand, this is not free. Mm -hmm. We have to provide staff, we have to provide law enforcement, we have to take time away from other things to go ahead and make sure that these things flow smoothly. So again, for the city, you know, what is the cost to that that we're supplying social services by providing all these free things? Mm -hmm. There's a cost to it, a taxpayer cost. So you have to look at a, a, a nonprofit has different ways of obtaining funding and they have different ways of doing that. But aside from the city providing the federal money, the state money, and anything else that we choose to provide as a line item, let that money be diversified by those agencies that we give it to. And let's not, let's not go ahead and add staff and everything else. But to the other point, let's be realistic and do an audit of where our funding comes from, how much goes to the county, like you, we talked about before when Mar Marsha and Dr. Cooper and myself went there. Let's look at all the services they provide, the lunch drops, the free lunches for the kids through the, through the system in the summer so that these kids can still eat year round. Let's look at hurricane preparedness. Let's look at the fact that cold weather shelters we had and we went through the churches for, again, a nonprofit for cold weather shelters. These thing, plans are all in place already, to your point, Lauren. They're all in place already. Let's not reinvent the wheel and let's do that and move in that direction of su supporting the community, but also understanding that that is, our job is, is to facilitate mm -hmm. the support and not provide an excessive amount of staff or, or taxpayer dollars. And, but we, and we should be relying on, on, the, on the, the nonprofits because that is what they want to do and that is how they do it. Okay, all right. I think I got clear direction on that one. Thank you. I'd like to turn to the topic of trust and confidence in local government. Uh, and I'd like to begin that, if you would, if you would grab that sheet I provided on uh, highly effective commission. Uh, and I'd also like to bracket one word that's been used consistently this morning is communication. Uh, communication about what county services provide, communication about how economic development occurs, communication about 
how growth management decisions are made, et cetera. Uh, and one of the, and this is just my impression of you and take it for what it's worth. I think one of your core challenges is communication with yeah. the public. Uh, that's a brilliant insight. I'll charge you two, two extra quarters for that one. <laughs> uh, because it does go, you know, to if, if it is very natural in life if we're, if we don't feel we're informed or understand or being communicated with, it's easy to distrust at a personal level, <laughs> at an organizational level. Uh, so I think, you know, one of the things I would like to talk about uh, is, you know, how do you all do a, a stronger communication strategy or communication plan, whatever, however that works out in words, because I think that is, is one key thing here. Uh, but I think the other thing here is, is uh, this is what I've learned from watching a lot of councils and commissions, some of which are very effective, some of which were not. And by effective, I mean they were able to make long-term good policy decisions, big investments. They had very stable functioning operations. You know, people were professional, they got their work done, it ran smoothly. Uh, the whole tone of the organization, the culture, and the community was just very productive. These were communities that are moving forward. They win awards, they succeed, they're achieving a lot. Are they perfect? No. Does everybody love each other? No. <laughs> you know, that's not what it's about. Uh, so if we could just talk about this, I, I would value your perspectives on it. So I, whoever I use it next, I can add your thoughts into it. Uh, but when I talk about understanding your role, and uh, one is your policymakers. Uh, often elected officials get in and they think their job is to tell the utility director, put the pipe here or there. Uh, your policy. Now, I do want, you know, we, public policy talks about public administration dichotomy, and there is that. There's this gray area where it's, you know, it's a little bit unclear, and you and your manager have to work that out, you know. Uh, but, you know, you're here to set policy. That's goals, that's strategic direction, et cetera. You're not here to, you know, make sure this piece of lawn is mowed or yard is mowed. That's the manager's job, you know. Uh, and the good of the whole is, is the thing. Uh, we've talked about that. You use the word municipal corporation, you are that, and your shareholders are all the residents. Uh, and you as a company, a corporation, provide public services. You're in that business. I also argue you're in a different business. You're in the business of experience. You're in the business of providing the experience of safety whether that's police, fire, codes, whatever. You're in the business of providing opportunity so that business can come, people can pursue their own dreams. You're in the business of respect. One of the criticisms I hear of commissions uh, is they don't respect us. And often that's how people interpret your behavior on the dais. Uh, a lot, and a lot of way, County Commission years ago was, uh, he was a clinical psychologist. So he was very good at listening to people when they were standing up, you know? And he would vote against them. And they would come up later and say, thank you. <laughs> you know, because they felt he had listened to them. So that's all part of the role. So I, I, don't, I don't diminish that respect uh, for, for, that they should give you and you give them. You're in that business of providing respect. So that's, that's one thing I've learned from watching effective commissions, that they, they do that. Any thoughts on that one? Victor? I'll jump in. Talking about respect, number, your practice number three, uh, respect each other and mm -hmm. staff on the dice, because I think it's important. Again, people feed off of us. Yep. Um, never assume someone else's motivation. Um, I think too many times well, I know why the mayor is doing that. Mm -hmm. And we're making those assumptions. And sometimes we make those assumptions publicly mm -hmm. and it creates other sure. um, challenges. Um, and to me, very important, don't personalize this agreement. Yeah. You, I, I think that's very important for us on this diet. Yeah. You know, sometimes we get too personal mm -hmm. and um, we have a function, a job to do. Mm -hmm. um, and sometimes, you know, I'm voting on something that personally I might disagree with. But as a whole, I know it's the best thing to do. Mm -hmm. um, but then to come up on the dais and personally mm -hmm. uh, disagree and show it to any one of my colleagues here, I, I, I think it's, 
it's not healthy overall. Mm -hmm. and, and people, the audience is gonna feed off of that. Mm -hmm. Again, how we speak, I always said in my classroom, my students are gonna feed off of my, my way of teaching. Mm -hmm. If I come in there with a mindset of just put my feet up and say whatever, my students are gonna behave that way. Mm -hmm. But if I come in there with a purpose mm -hmm. and realize I have a function, a job to do, mm -hmm. they're also gonna respect that. Mm -hmm. And I think for me, Respect is bottom line. Mm -hmm. We're going to disagree. That's fine. Yep. That's, that's all part of this. Mm -hmm. if, we're, if we're not disagreeing, it's then there's problem. a problem. Yep. Yep. That's the way I see it. Kind of like in a marriage. When you're all happy married, I don't, <laughs> I don't argue with my wife. I don't argue with my husband. There's a problem there. Because yeah. yeah. then there is no communication. Yeah. But if we have some good communication and respect with each other, that dialogues. That, listen, I think, honestly, this morning, we've had dialogues and somehow we've agreed or disagreed. But no one's been disrespectful to anyone. Sure. Now, I hate to put it this way, there's no one in the audience. So sometimes we behave mm -hmm. because we want the audience to see a certain thing. Mm -hmm. And I think that's where the challenge comes, that sometimes people run for office and, and they're advocators mm -hmm. in the community, that's great. But once you get elected, mm -hmm. your role changes. Mm -hmm. And we have to be conscious of that. Mm -hmm. You know, it's not no longer than me coming up to the dais right. and knowing that I might have a group of folks out there in the audience that might agree with me and whatnot and me just right. throw that fuel to the fame because mm -hmm. it's just not helpful at the end of the day. And, and we need to realize that. Mm -hmm. We, our roles change. Mm -hmm. It's not personal any longer. Right. You know, it's, this is what's the better good for everyone here. Mm -hmm. And um, I welcome conversation. I welcome dialogue that we can go back and forth because mm -hmm. we're going to learn. I always tell my employees, my door is open, just be prepared to defend your statements or whatever suggestions, but we're going to respect each other. And, and I think at the end of the day, if we have that, the dynamics out there are going to change. And I said this the last time we spoke, we can't control them. We can't, we should not expect them or tell them how they need to behave or who, how, what to say or what not to say. But if we reflect that, that audience out there is gonna change. That doesn't mean we're telling people to be quiet. That doesn't mean we're taking their First Amendment away. No, it's just there has to be a form of respect. Mm -hmm. You know, mm -hmm. you don't just walk into someone's house and, and say whatever you want just because you feel okay. you have the right to do that. Mm -hmm. And I think if, if we can do that, I, I think the dynamics will be great. That's what I call the power of the dais because how elected officials behave up there sets an enormous tone for your organization, sets a tone for your community. Uh, when the folks up there, wherever, not just Deltona, are fighting, attacking one each other, the community thinks, well, that's how you do it. <laughs> you know, that's what it's about. And staff become de demoralized and want to keep their heads down <laughs> and not going to give you their honest opinion about anything. They're going to try to say as little as they can. Uh, so the power of the dais is enormously important. Uh, and it, it can move your community so far forward that you won't believe it. <laughs> or it can put you so far back, you know, so it's an important thing. I'd like to also talk about personalization for a minute. Uh, I, I talk about this a lot because I think it's one of the things that can literally make you sick. Uh, it can make you ill in, this, in your job if you start to personalize. Uh, I've seen it happen to folks, you know, they, they start to personalize it and then it, it just booms, you know, and everything becomes personal and they think it's all about people attacking them and their mental health and life and stress goes down. So, you know, it's, it's not just because I think it's good practice, but I think for your own personal health, if you start to personalize, you're going to start to hurt yourself, you know. Uh, this is a hard job you do. You know, you don't get a lot of plaudits for it. <laughs> you know, it's a tough job. It's an important job. Uh, so, you know, that's why I say that, because I, I really do value people who are willing to do public service uh, and do this job. It's really important. Uh, but if you can avoid personalizing, it's so much better for your own health. Marcy? Thank you. So I, I think that one of the things a lot of the residents who come to the meetings and, and even those who are watching at home don't understand that there are limitations to what us at the dais sure. uh, can do and say. Mm -hmm. uh, for instance, when you have uh, public comments, mm -hmm. 
we cannot respond right. to their right. comments or their questions, right. right? This is something that it's not that was decided by the commissioners, but this is something that's part of the policies or whatever rules were written for elected right. officials, at least here in Deltona. I don't know if it applies for everybody else, but that's something that we have to respect. Totally right. And so when somebody's making a public Common and they they come back and say, oh, you know, you just sit up there, you don't answer, you don't say anything. You, you, I would love to answer, you know, mm -hmm. not only as of respect to that person, but also to defend my actions or defend of what I'm being told that I'm not doing. Okay. But right. we can't, okay. right? We can't. Well, um, so, so let's 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 stay with that because I, you know, I have heard that from the community. Uh, I've heard in a lot of other communities. Uh, and, and Marsha, I'll ask you to chime in as you, as you will. Uh, and, and I'm not personalizing this to Deltona mm -hmm. uh, from my general experience. One of the things that I've seen occur and have heard public talk about is when you're on the dais and they're talking, you know, you have a lot to do. And sometimes, you know, you're reading the next agenda item or you're in a conversation or something. And so people feel like, they're not being listened to because there's no eye contact. There's no, I'm, I'm hearing you sort of stuff. And that, that's one factor of it. Uh, and that I think you can control. Mm -hmm. uh, there are reasons why people uh, don't encourage a dialogue because then that opens it up and it does. What I, I think an effective way, and I'm gonna ask Marcia to comment first on the legalities, but I think you certainly can acknowledge, thank you for your comments. I'm gonna ask the manager to look in that, or I'll ask the attorney to look into it, so there is a response if it's a request or something. And there is a response. It comes from the chair at that right. point That's of the, chair's the, job. Of, of the right. meeting, which is the chair. But us as individual um, commissioners cannot, right. okay. unless we decide to make a comment during our comment time, time and we time. choose that topic sure. to, you know, the opportunity to respond to that. Okay. So piggyback into that, which is probably the same thing that Marsh is going to talk about, it goes back to our districts. So each commissioner is responsible for their district. Mm -hmm. um, I know when I went for my initial training when I was elected, Commissioner Sosa is responsible for District 3. Mm -hmm. I'm responsible for District, I'm sorry, District 6. I'm responsible for dis <laughs> District 3. Uh, district here, District there, you know. <laughs> like, look what you've been doing wrong this whole time. <laughs> we switch around. So, um, you know, we are elected officials for the entire city of sure. Deltona, but we are responsible for Denver. each district. So yeah. if somebody from District, for another district, uh, has a problem, which has happened, sure. and and I choose to respond to that um, because they're they're demanding at that point. Nobody's getting back to me. You know, I think it's only right that somebody responds. So then, I will respond. But my only response is I am copying our city manager sure. to sure. follow up on your whatever. Okay. If something happens behind the scene that I do uh, take some kind of action with that person from another district, I will forward it to Mr. Peters and say, Mr. Peters, this is what has happened. Can you please have that commissioner follow up on it? Sure. So this is the process we do behind the scenes. And our residents don't see that. Sure. So that's why a lot of times we get attacked that we don't do we our job. Okay. Um, so again, it's a communication. It's communication, but we cannot communicate that to the public okay. because of the Sunshine State law, yeah. right? Yeah, you're, uh, you're personally, Ted, I'm talking about the organizational communication of letting people know. Right, well, my communication point of contact is Mr. Peters, Absolutely. and he is up to date. Now, whether he wants to share that information with everybody else, that's his choice, which he can do, sure. which have, he have seen him done, okay. share a lot of my emails with everybody, with all the other commissioners. Okay, all right. Let's let Marcia okay. comment on uh, um, the, 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 I, the... I thought I would bring the operating guidelines and meeting rules and procedures for the commission this morning. I just kind of had a hunch I might be asked something. So anyway, um, we have these rules that have been developed with this commission 
Some have changed over the years. We made a lot of changes when people started using bad language and things like that. So we've changed some of these rules, but for the most part, parts of these rules have been in place basically from the beginning. And, and one whole section goes to meetings because you get a lot of comments and um, you have to control the meeting. Um, and all of you have seen what happens when we get out of control, which <laughs> is always unpleasant for all of us. So, so when these, these rules, but they, they have been approved by the commission, they can just as easily be changed if there's a desire to, but one of those is I, members of the city commission, shall not enter into discussion or respond to individuals' comments during the public forum other than to give directions or to ask for clarification. So you can do those things. Um, a city commissioner shall not be asked a direct question except through the mayor. So, you know, by the same token, it's not like, it's not a sunshine violation for you to discuss a matter that was raised by somebody in your district after the meeting. That's not a sunshine violation. Well, I wasn't referring, okay. and that's why I said, unless you choose to, to take that, you know, that comment and, and go over it during your comment time. But I'm, I'm referring to the point where there's public, uh, public uh, uh, comments and someone from the public comes and addresses something. We cannot respond. We cannot answer that question. So I, I'm just trying to um, let the residents know that we are not sitting there looking at them and ignoring them because we want to or we are disrespecting them is that that it's something we are not allowed to do uh, address a okay com a and, common question or and perhaps what you know if the mayor is amenable when they ask a question of the mayor that you know and one of you light up or whatever she can direct usually the kind of answer they want would come from the city manager um, but if it's something else i mean you know the the mayor can always say our rules don't allow you know, the particular commissioner answer at this right. point, but the commissioner can follow up with you. Right. And so what I'm saying is you guys can get more of that understanding between the public and the board if you just follow some of those types of things. So, you know, now some people don't care and they won't care that we have to have some rules to keep order. Right. You know, but you could do more of that, I think. Right, and and that's and and and, and I understand what you you know. I that's exactly my point. But I'm just trying to, since we're talking about respect and and acknowledging our residents' comments and stuff, I just want to, you know, make sure that they understand. Right. We sit there, up there's here. There's a reason. There's a reason why right. we sit up here and and just look at you and listen to you and don't respond. It's not that we don't want to. When I got first elected, I did respond and I was reprimanded for it. So, you know, I just wanted to point that out. Um, right. okay. and, and again, each district commissioner is responsible for their own district. Doesn't mean we cannot help right. somebody else from another district, but there's a procedure to follow. Protocol. It's between me and you, you're in district six, right. I'll help you, but I'll pass everything on to Mr. Peters sure. and Mr. Peters will share with David so that he can continue taking over whatever okay. we have left off. And again, this is not what we want to do on a personal level, it's what we are told and expected to follow the rules. Okay. So again, it's a communication issue about here's how this city operates uh, and that your comment will be responded to in whatever the appropriate mechanism may be the manager or somebody else. But it's providing that information that's important to, to folks. Well, John? Uh, just so everybody understands how this often works with me. If I receive something, say, from uh, Mr. Vila Vodkaz, and um, I think it's something that the rest of the commission may have an interest in. I will share with the rest, <laughs> and, 
and I will delete any reference to you. I'll delete the forward part, the FW part. And I will tell you all for your information, and I will tell you if you have any response, please contact me privately. That way you all don't respond back to each other. You, you let me know if you have a concern, and that way I can kind of get the, the flavor of the day. Um, but that's generally how, so quite often when you see one of those, it is something that I receive from a commissioner that I think all of y'all may need to be aware of. Oftentimes I'll get something back saying, yeah, we all, we all got it or something like that. Um, but um, I try to keep you all informed of things that you know, may be of interest to every one of you, especially code items. Just to add to that, um, when Maritza and I came on, on the commission, uh -huh. we were instructed if you get an email and the email is to the mayor and commissioners, don't respond to it. Mm -hmm. Let the city manager respond to it. That's what we were told. Okay. And, and so a lot of times when I see an email like that, unless, it, unless they said Commissioner King, mm -hmm. if they're calling some commissioner out by name, then that commissioner obviously should, they're addressing you, you should respond. But if it's just sent out to mayor and, mayor and commissioners, mm -hmm. don't respond to it. Um, the city manager will, will handle that email. And, okay. and, and Commissioner and that's, King. That's what we were told. And Commissioner King, I'm glad you brought that up. Um, and quite, a, and that is not something that you would have done improperly in terms of sunshine. But for instance, if you had um, you know, somebody in the audience send all of y'all an email and all seven of you all responded to that person, then they could respond back to another commissioner and say, oh, well, y'all have a majority. They're all for this project. Uh, that would be a sunshine violation. You right. didn't do it yourself. It was a third party that created the sunshine violation. And the way to avoid that is to have it come through the city manager. That way, you know, you don't have a third party um, process in place that could create a sunshine violation unbeknownst right. to you. And, yeah. and normally is, when I receive emails like that and I don't see that the city manager has been copied, I just forward it to him and I just say, please advise just because I'm trying to avoid any of that problem of going back and forth, then at the end of the day, it's the city manager. So then I'll follow up with the city manager if it's something in my district. There's many times I get a phone call. My first question is, have you reached out to the city? Because I think what, what happens is sometimes people get in the habit that it's my job, right, to go out and do this stuff when they haven't even reached out to the city. So my question is, have you reached out to the city? No, well, I need you to reach out to the city manager, then I will follow up. And I said, Mr. Peters, did you receive this? Yes, where are we? And then if the city hasn't done anything as it should, then as a commissioner, then I have that conversation with Peters. Uh, but I think too many times what happens is people just send it directly to us without even giving the city an opportunity to address it. And then when we start shiming in, then that's what creates a problem. And, and we, we kind of like mess up the process, if I can just use that word. Okay, so I want a clarification right now because I hear three different scenarios right here. Okay. Um, Commissioner King is saying that, well, as we were instructed, you know, if it's not addressed to us, you ignore it, right? Sorry. Then I hear if, 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 you know, you, if it's not, a, if it's not a copy to the city manager, then I would advise you, well, you need to get a hold of my, your city, you know, the city manager. I, in turn, do not reply to all, but I reply to the sender, to the resident, and I let them know I am copying the city manager so that he can follow up on your request or your concerns. And I just copy Mr. Peters, and Mr. Peters takes on from there. So what is the proper way? Okay, well, let's, let's be clear. So what we're talking about is situation, mayor and commission. That's the address. Somebody sends mm -hmm. to everybody here. Uh, a variety of ways you could do that. One could be if it's mayor and commission, it's responsibility to the mayor to forward it to the manager and the rest of you 
you've given that responsibility to the mayor and you want to, or every one of you could forward it to the city manager and he now has seven emails to read. <laughs> Is there any other option you would recommend, Marcia? No, I, I think the only distinguishing factor is when it's addressed to any of you specifically. If it's addressed to any of you specifically, then you have every right to deal with it or send it to the city manager with a note saying, you know, um, this is in my district and they've addressed it to me. Can you, do you have a solution? And, and I think Victor said, and please advise. I mean, that kind of covers it. So that's if it's directly sent to you. If you get the mayor and all the commissioners, and you, fo you can also say please advise if it's in a question that's being asked that you're interested in when you forward it to the city manager. So that pretty much, I think, covers all of it. Okay. You know, without what? Without responding to the resident? Because this is the this is a lot of complaints that we get as well. Okay. You know, you sometimes I get emails. They're not in my district, but I can see that this resident is desperate for an answer because nobody's responding to them. So at that point, I'm going to take it upon myself to say, you know, I am copying Mr. Peters on mm -hmm. your email so that he can follow up with you. Yes. I'm not copying anybody else. And I'm that's just copying fine. the resident and, you, yeah. and the city manager. I thought I, I'm sorry, Maritza, I thought I kind of started with that. But so what I'm saying is if it is, if it is an issue that you feel the need to respond to or want to say what you're doing, you can go right ahead. And as long as you do a forward and not copy all or anything, you're fine doing it. And you can also say, uh, I'm asking the city manager to advise me on, you know, whatever happens. That's all fine for any of you. And I also think that when we're talking about speaking in the meeting, you know, you could push your light on when somebody is trying, because sometimes they'll try and address you, any of you, and then the mayor will say, you have to address the mayor. And then, you know, if, if the mayor sees your light on or whatever, you know, you, the mayor could say, I understand that, you know, you may be in Maritza's district or whatever, and we're going to make sure that the city manager responds <laughs> to your commissioner and, um, uh, with a response to your problem. I mean, we could do something like that. That's not hard. If that is like a real sticking point where people think you guys are not being responsive, then we can, we can adjust those kinds of things pretty easy, I think. So let's ask Marcia to uh, think about that and would John develop a set of protocols or whatever you want to we call can, them. We can, we could amend the policies, you know, and even though I hate to, you know, make them more complicated than they well, already I'm not, are. I'm not asking for amendment of the policy. Okay. I, would, I just wanted a clarification. Okay. Yeah, clarification. Yeah. All right. You really want the public educated to understand. Exactly. That, I, I just want the goal. public to understand is that we're okay. trying to be disrespectful by not responding. It's okay. just that this That's is the policy. Okay. okay. So we can ask that the mayor perhaps make that a standard comment mm -hmm. before so that people understand well, you're not going to respond. Okay. My, my vision on this is... Uh -huh. Okay, let's look at the Constitution. Everybody up here is an elected official, correct? That's sitting on this side here. You took an oath to do what? Uphold the Constitution. Mm -hmm. What is in the First Amendment of the Constitution? There's five major factors. Mm -hmm. One of them is what? The right mm -hmm. for the residents to petition their government. Mm -hmm. So when I have somebody that comes up to the dais or to the podium and they ask a question, mm -hmm. whether it's a hard question or not, I feel as a representative, an elected official, I should have the ability to answer that question. Now, that being said, you know, they have four minutes. Are they willing to give up some of their time for you to answer? To, for, for me to be able to answer mm -hmm. their question? Now, I, I think that's something that maybe we need to look at because you're right. You look like you're, you know, just totally out of the loop not answering the question and you know 
not everybody, I don't think, has to address the chair. I mean, if, if somebody comes up here and the, the, can I use you, sir? Absolutely. You're in my district. Article you come up. Five, please, by all means, use me. All right. You're, you're in my district. You come up. You, I did something you don't like. Okay? Whatever it happens to be. And you want to know, why did I do this a certain way? Why did I vote a certain way? I, as an elected official, owe you an answer on why I did that. So I, I feel that when we make decisions up there, you better be able to back up your decision, why you did it. And if your resident comes up to you and they ask you, why did you vote like that? We can't just plead, oh, I can't do it because the rule says I can't answer you. I think we owe the residents an answer on why we vote a certain way. Whether Now, he may agree with my answer, he may disagree with my answer, but that is why I voted a certain way. And I think when residents come up here, that we, we owe them the courtesy of a response. Yeah, I, I think that's something as a commission that we need to maybe look at. Um, it, it, we, we talk about the lack of attendance at meetings. We, we talk about the lack of attendance at city commission meetings. The, the only time we really get a huge crowd is what? When it's a controversial issue, mm -hmm. usually it's about rezoning, you know, agricultural land to an RPUD in the middle of a bunch of agricultural property. That, that's general. I mean, that, that's happening all over the town. It's not specific to one area. So, you know, it, it's, it's something that I believe we owe the residents a response. If they take the time to come to City Hall to petition their government, we should give them the courtesy of a response. But they should know that, hey, you have four minutes. If you take three minutes to ask a question, I only have one minute to answer. If it's not a complete answer, your time's up. I will see you after the meeting. So let's stay with that one for a minute. Uh, and I, I certainly agree with the premise. Uh, I think for me there's a distinction. Some questions can be answered immediately, like your example. Some you really don't want to answer immediately because staff may need the time to respond or something. Uh, to me the key is saying people, you're going to get an answer. We may be able to answer it right now. We may have to have the manager get with you to answer it. You know, would you accept that dichotomy? Well, absolutely. But yeah. you know, me, a, a me, lot of it me. is once I've already voted on something, mm -hmm. there should be an answer why I voted the way. You, you know, or if I well, if I send an email to somebody, I should be able to back up my email. Now, if I'm on the fence on it and I say, you know, this is how I feel, but I gotta, you know, get with the city manager, maybe get with the city attorney to make sure, yeah, you know, I'm sure. correct. I, I don't have a problem with that. I think, okay. you know, but okay. we as a commission owe our residents that show up to these meetings the courtesy of a response. I think you're absolutely right, and I don't think there's a person in here that would disagree with that. Yeah. But I think what, what we're talking about here is how do we communicate with people and still move the meeting along at a regular mm -hmm. pace? You, you have so, four minutes. Well, the person has four minutes to speak. If they ask any one of us a specific question about something, doesn't matter what it is, why I voted the way I did or whatever, I think that I should have the opportunity to respond, but my response, I believe, should be, that is a great question and I will meet you right after the meeting uh, to give you my answer. If I, if I can interject right now, um, Remember when the people come up under their time, they are addressing the chair. So their response to the chair appropriately should be, you know, I'm really concerned as to why certain people voted a certain way. Now, what I have seen in my past is Commissioner Sosa under your time just a few minutes later because on our agenda, we have consent, and then we go to commissioner's Commissioner comments. So if you dispense the consent agenda pretty quickly, you will have an opportunity under your time to exactly. say to the gentleman who spoke earlier, the reason I voted X, Y, Z is da 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 You will have given them the response. You would keep the meeting in an orderly process because 
The key thing that we have not done a good job of, and I'm not fussing at you, Mayor, please don't take it as such, is people are supposed to address the chair, not the mayor, the chair. And they say, you know, I'm really bleepity bleep about the boat y'all took last week. I'm really confused as to how you could do that. Then, under your time, each one of you all could respond if you so desired. Uh, and that would be the appropriate manner under the process that we have in place. One of the advantages of having moved the public participation to later in the meeting is you only have the consent item before it goes to your time. So it's just a matter of a few minutes before you would have an opportunity to respond. Uh, Mr. Peters, I think um, that's one of the things I mentioned, that right. we have a choice to comment or answer a question mm -hmm. during our comment time. Sure. And I think we've done that a couple of times also. We, you know, we have taken a uh, opportunity. Well, and, and again, uh, my <laughs> this all started by me trying to explain to the residents that it's not that we are trying to be disrespectful right. by just sitting up there and not responding. Okay. Um, okay. That's, that's okay. what my okay. point right. to get across all was. Right. So a, a clear communication about the process during your time, we're going to listen to you. In our comments, uh, we may choose to respond mm -hmm. to your questions at that time, and that's the structure that we work here. And we do that so the meeting can move forward and everybody, we can get our business done professionally and everybody can have their time. And, and, and just and to wrap. As a suggestion, yes. as a suggestion, the city clerk could add a note to our agenda item under public participation. Um, the commissioners will not respond during public participation, but may wish to under their time. And that way, the public knows that there's a possibility that that would occur. Let me go to the mayor and then back to Dave. So, so, so just to, to wrap this up, you know, comments under items on the agenda, under a listed item under the agenda are to a specific point. If, if someone comes up there and says, I don't want you to, you know, I don't know, buy that vehicle or something like that. Why are you buying that vehicle? You have 10 vehicles sitting out there. Explain that to me. City manager, can you please explain, answer the resident's question? It's a, to a specific item on the agenda that we're gonna be voting on. Mm -hmm. and, 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 and that's one That's one issue. The other is public comment for any item not on the agenda. Right. Okay. Right. That is the second thing, and I will agree, Maritza and, and and David as well. You know, when my mom said, "Why don't you Why don't you answer these people?" She watches the meetings. Why don't you answer these people? They come up there and they ask these questions, and you're not answering the people. And I said, "Mom, I understand that, and that for me was very difficult too to not provide an answer initially. And in the beginning, we didn't do anything. Now, I try to say, "Please go to the clerk." see the city manager. Mr. Peters, please provide an answer to that resident as to why there's no traffic light at XYZ or when the traffic study was done and so on and so forth. When it's a specific comment, when it is a comment that was, for example, at the last meeting directed to me last time in public comment, where I was accused of basically having a personal relationship with an ex-city employee, and that's why he left, news to me, there's no right or wrong answer for me to sit up there and defend those kind of comments. If I go up there and say, and I say, can I take part of your time to give you my thing or go in a back and forth, that audience member is not gonna care what my answer is. It's an accusation, it's an opinion, and, and no matter how much I argue that, it's not gonna change. So I think the context of what a question is and what a public comment is reflects the need for an answer or the desire for an answer. I could have addressed that in my public comment in my, in my time at the end. It's not gonna change anybody's opinion of what they think per se in that, that relationship or that, that comment. So I think everything is in context and I believe the public should be answered. They should be answered in email. I have an automatic reply on my email. 
And the automatic reply is, this will be sent to the appropriate staff member and so forth, however it's worded, so that there's an automatic reply. So they understand, I don't know why the park benches in Festival Park are not painted. It will be answered or it'll come back to me so that I can answer that. Okay. There's a process, but I think it needs communication and clarification. Okay. All right. I think that, you know, I, I, think, I, I, I agree David. with with the mayor. There, there is like certain that's something a question that comes up or a comment that comes up that's personal, like a personal attack on on anybody. Does that need to be addressed from no. the doc? No, I mean you can if you want. I mean I personally wouldn't get into that. Right. But if somebody comes up and asks me a legitimate question right. about city business huh. that I have the answer to. Mm -hmm. I should be able to give them the answer. If I don't have the answer, I believe the city manager is the one that should be answering that. And then, you know, and that's up to me. If I make I make a decision up there and somebody wants to know why I voted a certain way, I should be able to answer that. Now if they come up and ask me something about transportation, I'm gonna have to say, yeah, that, that that's yeah. Mr. Peter's specialty, I don't know. But are you comfortable with the process of during public comment, you you won't respond, but in your comment section, you can respond then as, as a process. I, I think we need to let the resident that comes up know, yes, I will address that in, in my comments. I mean, if we don't, if we don't okay. tell the resident I will address that in my comments, then no, I'm not comfortable with that. I think it needs to be addressed. Okay. So let, let's stick how we can do it. I mean, yeah. if, if the mayor says during public comment, uh, if any of the commission wish to respond to you, they will. Would that? be satisfactory? Yeah, or maybe, it's yeah. your choice. Maybe, 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 you know, chime in on the commissioner who's getting questioned, hey, do you have an answer for this person? And if you have an answer, say yes. If you don't, say no, I'll get back to them. Well, I, I just like to leave the process clear here, so. I, uh, yep. Yes. yes, that would take mm -hmm. change. Uh, I mean, sometimes we do need some changes. Well, I'm not saying oh. you can't change. Yeah. Okay. Lauren. Yeah. Um, I just wanted to, just throw this out here because we we're talking about communication, mm -hmm. but I have to tell you, and I, and y'all know this, so I'm preaching to the choir. Everything we do is communication. Mm -hmm. It's not necessarily the words that we speak. Mm -hmm. And when people come to the up to the podium to speak, and and we, you know. Uh, look at our at the desk or we play with our phone or maybe we're not playing maybe we're looking something up that we think is very important that is communicating to the residents that what they have to say is not important and so I think it's very important that the Commission takes the time and gives it to the, the resident, look them in the eye, listen to what they're saying, because they don't know if we are or we're not unless we're looking at them, and and we might even respond with some, you know, a nod of the head or or oh I don't mm, I don't know about that, but something so that they know that we're listening. We you can keep your mouth shut. But at least they know that they are important we'll enough to. that you've listened to them. Okay. And I think there's many times when we sit on the dais and we get to, to public comment and we're doing something else. It doesn't look like we are interested in what they have to say. And you know what? It doesn't matter who it is. It doesn't matter. Okay. It, no matter whether they're, you know, the most influential person in the city or, or the per poorest person in the city. Doesn't matter whether, you know, they're an activist or they're the l most passive person in the world. We need to look at people and listen and let them know that their comment is valued okay. because you that, know, that is communication sure. too. That, that they were heard. Yeah. That they were heard. Okay. If, well, if, I don't want to try to make sausage here today. What I'd like to leave to the, your two professionals here, to, to, and they've heard the process and your concerns, come back to you with 
uh, a response, but, and then y'all can have a piece of paper and, and look at it inside. 30 seconds real quick, because sure. okay, I agree, and I, and I think we, we, we might be making more trouble for ourselves than anything else, but I don't want the perception that we don't have the ability to respond up there. We all have commission comments. What you do with your commission comments is up to you as a commissioner. If you feel to respond then, you could. If you feel not to respond, that's your choice. But I think that the mindset that we don't have the ability to respond, it's incorrect. Every single one of us can respond. Do we have a process? Yes. Is it favorable for everyone? Probably not. But it's gonna have its ups and downs. But at any point in time, I think yes. There's a reason why she's the chair and things need to be addressed that way. And we need to have some type of formality so that we can have the process okay. work. Okay. And at any point in time, I can say during my commission comments, well, the gentleman who said this, yada, 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 yada. Okay. All right. And to conclude, Maritza's point is let's make that publicly understood. Whatever your process is, y'all decide, make sure everybody understands it and then act consistently and fairly with it, okay? You worked a long time. Lunch is on us. It's somewhere. I don't know where is lunch. Or it's not. in the back. It's in the back? Okay. Uh, let's reconvene about a, in 30 minutes or less. Very uh, courteous and asked, talk to me about all the things I wanted to talk to you about. Uh, but I want to make sure there's an opportunity uh, for y'all to add anything else you'd like to uh, talk about today. We'll uh, do that at about a quarter of two. Uh, we're going to stop. And I'm going to ask John to just review the direction he's received today. It's important that he walk out of here clear. And if we need to clarify anything, we will. Uh, and then, uh, so that's, so now it's just really open. So, Maritza, comment? No. We'll talk any, any, anything, any topics y'all would like to add, put on the table. Commissioners, did you want to go ahead and address any topic that um, Herb has not addressed, or do you want any um, delve a little deeper into into anything? And um, if no one does, uh, I would just like to touch on one thing. Why don't you begin? Okay, um, on, we talked about economic ec economic development. Um, and I apologize, I wanted to try to, um, to talk about the economic drivers. Okay. And I think I touched on that, and, and I just wanted to, you know, again, talking about communication, talking about, you know, bringing, f bringing a framework forth to the residents and, and to staff also. Because I think when we have a, a, a better framework of what, what we want the city to, to be or how we want to move forward on certain things, I think that it helps staff as well mm -hmm. to understand what their focus is on and what it what it is on and what it shouldn't be on. Mm -hmm. And I think that falls into the economic development category and it, ta it falls into um, other categories like how we, um, Maritza brought up earlier how she used to have a, volu a big volunteer group and now there's not that many volunteers. Victor said we need coaches. I think you said we, we need coaches in, in different things. So as the city changes, I think that a lot of times when, you, when you're a member of the community, whether you're a resident or you're, you're an elected official, you, you kind of think on terms of what you know and what your experience is and what you think and maybe what's going on in your neighborhood. But that's not always the reality. So uh, could you touch a little bit on economic development drivers and what, what actually drives economic development and how, how that comes to a city? Because I think, I know Mr. Peters touched on it a little bit with demographics, but I think also what drives economic development is how the board works and how and and the and the vision and the narrative that we put forth. Mm -hmm. Sure, uh, I'll do that. And John, chime in, please. Uh, <laughs> the let me go out from several perspectives. Uh, one, when and one, uh, you're trying to attract outside businesses in industries, whatever you know. You know, those folks are going to look at you in a variety of ways, uh, and some of them you know, are purely 
like you're a lo good location for, you know, logistics. Probably not in a great location for a company that wants to promote snowing, snow skiing, you know. Uh, so they, they have external factors with just the reality and you either got it or you don't have it, you know, and that's just how it is. They also look at the quality of the school systems as an important variable. Uh, they're going to look at infrastructure, when whatever infrastructure is important to them. You know, one of y'all's advantages is I-4. That's a major piece of infrastructure, you know. Uh, and you've talked today about the gaps that you have. Uh, a variable that people look at, and I can't tell you how significant it is, is, is what's the culture attitude of the city. If they feel like they're stable and this commission can make a commitment and the future commitments commissions will stay with it, they're more likely to do that. If y'all have a history of, well, the commission in 2010 said this, but they reversed it in 2012, and we, you know, some company spent a half million dollars for nothing, you know, that puts you down on the list, you know. So I, I do think the, the stability of government is a variable. Is it the most significant one? I can't say that, you know, uh, but I think it is. Uh, also, you know, John talked about market studies. Uh, you know, you can't go after everything in the world. You gotta decide where your niche is. I was proposing on a project for Haines City, Florida. If you know Haines City, they, they do oranges there traditionally, you know? And somebody had come in and convinced them they could compete with Silicon Valley. They wasn't a person in that town could code. And why these young millennials who want to move to Haines City, I could just never get past it, you know? So I just didn't get that job, thank goodness, because I could have failed magnificently there. Uh, so I think, you know, part of it is, you know, Jerry's done that, you know, you know logistics, healthcare, y'all are in good, y'all got some good targets, you may want to refine that. Uh, I view retail as, as not a driver, but a follower. When the numbers are right, you know, John gave somebody, you know, you gotta have so many people with a mile and that. Publix is looking at our little town now because we're just about enough how rooftops, they think it works, you know. So retail, it's more you've just got the infrastructure that allows it. You don't really go to attract it. They'll come when the numbers are right. And they'll do what you want them to do when the numbers are right. What you really want to attract are what I actually call the exporters, the folks who come here and they send something out. That may be a product, that may be a service. You know, but that's who really generates the money for you because they're starting to really bring money in to support those jobs and all. So whether it's manufacturing, whether it's professional services that, you know, are, have a client base beyond Deltona, that's, that's really where I think your, your economy starts to drive. Uh, and then, you know, all the, some of it is just uh, idiosyncratic. I, I was working in the city of St. Petersburg and they, they attracted some, not huge, not Fortune 500, but fairly large company. And guess why they came? The CEO came there on vacation, and they have some wonderful bicycle trails in Pinellas County. Mm -hmm. And he said, I'm moving here. <laughs> you know? So, you know, who knows? Your bicycle trail may attract something. There, there's some variables here that, you know, you just don't know. But, you, you know, you do have that advantage of weather, and you have some nice features. Uh, and so you'll attract people off that. Uh, you know, and the other thing, you know, y'all, you know, I mean, this is this is one growing region, <laughs> you know, uh, and the opportunities that are going to be here are just, I think, probably amazing, you know, uh, okay. and if, uh, you know, it's just a matter of having the nice features <clears throat> and being in the right place at the right time. John, why don't you give a more Mayor, eloquent and detailed if, answer? Can I real quickly, John? Oh, sure. Before, because it, it, it's one of the indicators he mentioned schools, and I wrote that real quickly down because that's something we can't control. Right. And I know a lot of times it comes up. Mm -hmm. Well, the school this, the school that. Well, those conversations need to go to the school board. Yeah. You know, because the school board are the ones that are making those decisions, not mm -hmm. necessarily us. But sure. you're right; it is also an indicator. Oh, yeah. But it's something that we don't have any control. I mean, right. yes, we have a, a good school board member; we can build on that communication. Right. But the decisions at the schools are being made at the school board, not necessarily us. Um, a couple things, um, and we have done this somewhat internally since I have taken over. Uh, we probably need to do a formal process. Is one of the items I have down is strategic planning for recreation. 
but um, we need to do a strategic plan for economic development. And this is the old fashioned SWOT analysis. Mm -hmm. You know, what are our strengths? Mm -hmm. What are our weaknesses? What are our opportunities? What are our threats? Um, now, the strength is we have a lot of potential employees. And then one of the weaknesses is the perception of the lack of higher education. Um, you know, if you do an analysis in the United States of cities of 100,000 that do not have a college or university, the list is pretty small. And we're close to being in there because we're not quite at 100,000. Um, but uh, when I worked at the city of Roanoke, we identified it, even though you had Holland University and Roanoke College in the adjoining cities, and you had Virginia Tech 45 miles up the road, the perception is the city of Roanoke did not have a, a higher education. So what we did is we provided space in the lower floor of a parking garage for, um, I think it was five or six universities to provide master's and doctorate programs in the city. Mm -hmm. um, the companies that pay well are looking for higher education opportunities for their employees. Mm -hmm. What we found was, in many cases, they're looking for the advanced degrees, mm -hmm. and the master's degrees, the doctorate degrees. So by providing that space um, for the people, the universities come in and have the classes there, uh, we were able to overcome that perception. Similarly, that's something we may want to look at is, you know, yes, we have Stetson, we have Embry-Riddle, we have Bethune-Cookman, we have UCF, um, but they're not here. Now, Bethune-Cookman is technically over here with a satellite, and that, but, you know, it's not the same. Um, so, uh, you know, that's something we may want to look at from an education standpoint. As I alluded to earlier, we have a lot of valuable locations with inappropriate lots or lack of utilities for the program together to deal with that. Um, you know, right now, other than the area around Amazon and even there, uh, we have more weaknesses than we have strengths when it comes to economic development. Uh, the land to the, uh, the south of the movie theater is an old platted subdivision that was never improved. Uh, there's multiple ownership. It will be very difficult to compile large enough lots to do much. So we're gonna have to find a way to make that happen. Um, we have some ideas that we're looking at. Uh, we'll bring it out when we're a little more, uh, a little further along in the process. Um, you know, the other thing is, you know, everybody talks about the the, the village or this downtown or whatever, the main piece of property up there is owned by a single entity. And it has been in that state for a long time. They have ag exemption, which means they're not real compelled to move quickly because they're not really paying taxes. Um, and that is difficult. Uh, I'm not suggesting that we try to buy it or anything, but we have to find a way to work around that situation. Um, so it's, you know, economic development is many things. It's partnerships. You know, I know Team Volusia to some people is a, a controversial thing. To some people it's a wonderful thing. The bottom line is Team Volusia, because they are a public-private entity, more private than public, uh, they're able to do things under Florida law that we can't. Uh, they're able to have certain contacts that we can't um, because of you know, our open records and all that stuff. And so there, there is a value there for an entity uh, such as Team Volusia. But you know, there's other possibilities in terms of uh, collaboration, uh, you know, I think we got a very good program going right now um, when it comes to Portland Industries. You know, we have a new project coming to planning and zoning Wednesday night. 
uh, for potentially 2.1 million square feet of additional uh, facilities. Uh, basically one and a half times the size of Amazon. Uh, that's a major project. Um, but I'm concerned about what happens after that. And so we're working diligently in, on the Rhode Island extension so it would open up that platted area um, so that we can get more development. Um, so you know, we're also you know, looking at what we can do to create more opportunity. You know, down there by the Publix on Jackson, you know, you got you know, two residential lots deep right on Saxon. If we were able to do assemblages and create um, uh, a parcel that would buildable, an opportunity to, uh, you know, you could use the, the road in the back as a reverse frontage to get traffic off of Saxon to where you can access that land uh, from the back side. Um, we have similar opportunities potentially on Deltona Boulevard but we got to think outside the box in terms of creating opportunity. Um, you know, as the mayor alluded to earlier, uh, we, we would dealt the hand we would dealt uh, when everything was developed. And you know, sometimes um, it's a challenge to do a, what's called a redevelopment. Uh, you know, CRA is technically the idea to do redevelopment, but um, you know, this taking redevelopment to another level, uh, but we have to identify where our weaknesses are and how we can address them. Um, because we do have one major strength and that is we have a very large work age group of available employees. Uh, we just need to get the business for them. And ideally, if you take care of the educational component, that will elevate us to the higher paying jobs and that's what's critical. That, in my personal opinion, is the reason that West Volusia has a very difficult time retaining the good paying jobs. Now you go right across the river, you're close to the UCF, you got um, Seminole State College and um, they're able to retain the triple A's and the uh, the companies over there on International Drive and uh, Lake Mary, down into Altamont, you know, those are well-paying jobs. And go goes back to what I said before, you get the well-paying jobs, you can see they have the restaurants <coughs> we want and the shopping we want. Uh, so, um, you know, we, we are in a unique position. We, we're fast approaching 100,000 population and um, we need to uh, grow up and be a, a community, 100,000, and, and uh, uh, address some of the deficiencies that we have in being in that population range. Thank you. I'd like, to, I'd like to add just a little bit to sure. that. Did you raise your hand? <laughs> <laughs> Does it matter which one? <laughs> I'll be just a second. Um, when we talk about education, a couple of years ago, if I'm not mistaken, y'all can correct me if I'm wrong, but I think we had a uh, pretty good technical school that was looking to come to Deltona, and that fell through. And went, it went to Daytona instead of here. And, you know, given our demographics I think that in addition to having higher education opportunities and don't forget Daytona State College is right next door mm -hmm. um, they just got a big award too to expand if the governor signs it a right. lot of money right um, but I think something that would be absolutely uh, in our favor would be to bring in or, or start talking to someone who wanted to bring in a technical school and, and get it here in, in the city. Um, because not everybody wants to go to college, but you can get a really good, have a really good career and make really good money if you just use your hands. And I think that uh, 
that if we had that opportunity available to um, many of our uh, young folks coming out of high school and, and still trying to figure out what they want to do with their lives, if they could get into a technical school, uh, they'd have it all figured out real quick. And I think we well, need to look that in that direction as well. Commissioner King, as you may know, I'm, I don't know if you are aware of this, but you know, electrical linemen get paid really well. And you know, if they go through an apprentice program and get the training, um, they can make I don't know anything significant, about that. I, I didn't think you would know anything <laughs> about it. Um, but yeah, you're, you're correct. I mean, even the uh, the uh, technical schools and that type of thing are a very valuable asset to have. And uh, so. Uh, so yeah. I'm going to jump in because it seems like everybody's taking my turn. But um, we went to we just had a uh, we went to a luncheon on Thursday. We had two um, elected officials uh, from Tallahassee come and speak. And one of the topics that was raised was vocational training. They also agreed that not all college degrees are important in, in somebody's career. Uh, with a vocational training, you, you know, you, you can go f really far working with your hands. And so I know that here we have Florida Tech, I think it's in the land, am I correct? Mm -hmm. Right? And I know that Commissioner, well, Victor and I visited uh, about two years ago, we went to an aviation um, school up in Longwood, I think it was, that was interested in coming out here. And these were military guys who owned this aviation company, and they were training on how to fix planes. Mm -hmm. And, and, and you were trained on the air condition of the plane, and you were trained on the electrical part of the plane, and so everybody had a different thing. And so it is true. I mean, we, my husband owned a sheet metal um, business in New York City, and we, you know, we earn our bread and butter through that, working with his hands. Mm -hmm. So I think, and, and a lot of people, when the stock market crashed, a lot of these uh, men and women, well, young men who work with their fathers and their grandfathers fixing cars, doing plumbing, doing electrical work on the side, had something to fall back on when they lost their job in the stock market. So yes, I think that um, vocational training would be a A++ plus 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 here in, in our area. Okay. Yeah. Did we respond to your question or not? Did you want to go? Commissioner? Yeah, yeah, I was, I was going to respond, but go ahead. Uh, yeah, I just want to piggyback on that, because I think when yeah, Mr. Marlowe and I sat down, we talked about, mm -hmm. you know, trade school, vocational training. Mm -hmm. um, and I've got to say, right now, D Pine Ridge High School, they have the Advanced Manufacturing Academy. They're doing the HVAC Academy. Mm -hmm. Now, once those kids get done at Pine Ridge High School, where do they go? Mm -hmm. um, my son is actually, you know, he's a junior, and he's going to be doing dual enrollment, and he's going to get into the engineering program. Mm -hmm. But I've got to take him all the way out to Ormond Beach almost mm -hmm. for the Daytona State program. You know, if we had something that was a little closer to home, because mm -hmm. you're, you're correct, FTC has a campus in Orlando, and they have the one, the small one over in Deland that used to be the Bright House. But if we could attract something, I don't know if that's something Jerry can work on, bringing but, somebody in to start some kind of a trade or vocational, you know, HVAC, plumbing, electrical. I, I think that would be an asset, especially mm -hmm. with our youth right now. We have a lot of youth in Deltona. I mean, times have changed and th they need somewhere to go mm -hmm. to keep them in-house here. Mm -hmm. We want to raise the salary so we can get our restaurants. You start getting some of those vocational trainings, some of those salaries are really good. Very good. So I, I think that's definitely an avenue. I think most people up here agree that we need some kind of vocational training as well. And if Anita, and and that's what I was going to touch base on is <clears throat> we currently have Pine Ridge High and we have Delta High. Both of those have exceptional, and I understand there's certain things we can't do because of the school board. That's not their way. But what we do have responsibility of is promoting exceptional schools when we have them. And recently, Deltona High, their ratings went up. Pine Ridge High, <clears throat> I think it's, it goes back to that promotion and branding of your city. And, you know, we need to utilize the resource we have, which is exceptional schools, and start promoting them. Because a lot of businesses, they don't realize, can I get mentorships? Can I, you know, 
we want to be that town that people want to come to and bring their families to because we have exceptional schools. Mm -hmm. And they can go from that school and get a job. You know, having that industrial park area is, is critical for not just Deltona, but Deltona, Deland, Orange City, DeBerry, mm -hmm. Lake Helen Osteen, all of our surrounding cities. And these are items that go back into that gallery of promotion, of promoting our exceptional schools, promoting what we have. You know, I don't always say, you know, people hate to have braggers, but we need to be bragging. Mm -hmm. We need to be bragging on what our schools are doing right now. And, and I get, hey, it's school board, school board, school board, but those schools are in our city. And we need to have them promoted. We need to be doing as much as we can so that they're encouraged. Mm -hmm. We want them to continue to be encouraged mm -hmm. and um, Deltona to be at that highest standard, in just mm -hmm. in my own opinion, because we have had over the years a, that's the school board, and it is in a lot of cases, but when it comes to us, our job is to promote those schools, mm -hmm. and if we want to bring more schools, we want to bring more technical schools, we want to bring more here, they're going to go where they're hearing how wonderful that place is. So I think if we, if we do a whole promotion on it and branding and put it in that gallery, that's gonna help us going to that next level. Yeah. Who's not gonna go where it's exceptional? Sure. And, Victor? and I would agree with you, and I had here Pine Ridge just because of the great job that they're doing. I know their manufacturing program is going now for well, maybe three or four years, because I know that was done under David. Um, and they also have the HVAC as well. Um, also, let's not forget, I know when we talk about Daytona State, we talk about that nursing building, but it's supposed to be two buildings, and one of them is supposed to be for manufacturing. Mm -hmm. and, and when I speak about the school and, and going to the school, it's decision-making when it comes to building schools. But I, I, I'm a quickly, I, I agree with you, and I'm, I'm in the forefront of always promoting what we're doing in our schools, because it is important. It, it's part of what we do here. Um, but absolutely, promoting their programs and, and creating those partnerships. I mean, Pine Ridge is having a career fair at the end of the month, or I think it's next week. The challenge that sometimes for just people, and guess, guess what? There are jobs out there, folks. Not all of them need a degree. It's just being able to understand and do something. Um, so I, I think absolutely, it's encouraging, continuing that partnership with our schools, um, and the same thing with Daytona State, which is what we have in our backyard. Um, and I think if we can continue to push them, um, obviously nursing, because we become that medical um, area, but they're also looking at manufacturing. So that chicken building is supposed to be about manufacturing to bring here to the city of Deltona. I'd like to share what one of my clients does about that once a month. They bring in somebody, you know, whether it's a high school club, a sports club who's, who's succeeded, and they make a presentation to them, you know, and they film it, and then they all take pictures, you know. And it's, it's just a very nice thing. Everybody feels recognized. It creates a very positive vibe in their community to contrast with some of the non-positive vibes you have. So there's a lot y'all actually can do in terms of really just recognizing and promoting, making the community aware uh, that all this stuff's here. Because they probably don't know. So, so to kind of wrap, wrap this up, I'm, <clears throat> I'm just going to go ahead and go back to what I try to go back to all the time, mm -hmm. and that is looking at statistics and numbers and facts and basing your decisions on that and not on our emotions, which we tend to do. Mm -hmm. We tend to, as a human being, sure. base our reactions on and our, and our policy making sometimes on emotion and what we think is going to be the good thing for our perception of the community. And the reality is, I agree 100%, we are lacking in vocational mm -hmm. Uh, training, everybody's hurting for that type of a, a, a skilled job. We have over 450 manufacturers in the county of Volusia. Right now, um, I work with VMA and the Volusia Manufacturing Association, and there are consistently over 150 jobs uh, that are open in manufacturing in this, in this county, and they can't find the skilled labor for it. The other side of that coin is, I believe it was last year, the year before, at one of our Team Volusia meetings, uh, Dr. Labasso, who's head of Daytona State, is a part of Team Volusia with Daytona State, and, and presentations were made in terms of their manufacturing. They had a manufacturing um, where you could do part-time in high school and part-time in college, mm -hmm. and part-time Daytona State, and, and do that dual enrollment, and they couldn't get, they couldn't get it filled. Mm -hmm. And recently, through VMA, they have a program countywide that they are working with um, 
businesses or working with manufacturers or working with like, uh, for example, like Boston Whaler, B. Braun, huge medical company uh, that is invested in, in the Daytona area and uh, other, other companies that we have in the Volusia County that are willing to do a two-year apprenticeship type program where you do the schooling, you do the apprenticeship, you become an intern there, and there's basically, you come out with no cost. Mm -hmm. They need 20 people, or 20, 25 people they're looking at. They have 11, 11 countywide. That is the only amount of interest that they can drum up. They're asking for people to want to participate in this program. And to your point, Maritza, when we went to that luncheon, the legislative delegation luncheon uh, on Thursday, the, the comment made was, from the state representatives, we have to change the mindset. Mm -hmm. And that is our biggest challenge, not only as, and, and we cannot do that as policymakers. We can promote, we can do what you said, we can encourage, and we can get the word out there and reach out to our schools and our community. And, and it's a great idea And what you said about Daytona State with the nursing and the manufacturing. Those are things that we need. But the reality is to change a community mindset and a, and a mindset of people that they don't have to go to college. Because we spent 30 years telling everybody they have to go to college and you're worthless if you don't have a college degree. And where is that on your resume? But the re reality is that we have to do a better job as a community, not only as elected officials, to get the interest and, and, and say what's out there because these, these people that go into manufacturing, it's not the old manufacturing. And I think the mindset is, it's like, I grew up in Milwaukee, it was a ton of factories. It's not like that anymore. You need the skilled labor to do that manufacturing. And then to piggyback on that, the decisions that we make as a commission should be a lot based on what Mr. Peters is talking about, doing a, a study on economic development, doing a strategic plan on parks, looking into your numbers. What are your realistic numbers of growth? Mm -hmm. What are your realistic numbers of your roads, your sewer system, your, your housing, and your demographics? And I think that one thing, not only us as a municipality, but a lot of municipalities fail to do, is to stay current on the changing numbers. Mm -hmm. Because you, Commissioner or Lauren, said, you know, why does the news journal publish that every couple of months because, or every couple of weeks, because everything changes. And you have to keep up with that change. And I think that that's a thing that we need to do as a city and, and look at how everything is changing and how we can incorporate our policies into that and our, our direction of how we wanna, how we wanna paint our masterpiece. Okay. Good analogy anyway. I'm gonna ask John to just sum up the directions he's heard today. I've got my own notes. Uh, I won't take time to go over with you. And then what I'd like to do after that, I'd like to go to each of you, if you can make just sort of your impressions, the value of the day, your takeaway from the day, uh, any expectation you have about what next. I'll wind up with the mayor to close it out. So John, you're uh, I got a list here. <laughs> I got circles here, let me put it that way. Uh, economic development workshop in the next year. Uh, neighborhood plan, um, events at the amphitheater, parks and recreation strategic plan, uh, social service liaison or slash communication within City Hall, and a list of um, past events and why they ended. It's the list Anything that else I you come. talked about you would like to just add to that list? Communication. And he's got, he's got yeah, alternative frames. That. Communication. Palettes. Communicate, communicate, communication, communicate. Communication. That needs to be the top of the list is um, the communication and the, the, the narrative, outreach, the community message. outreach. And the messaging. And the messaging. And, and I think, Mr. Right. Peters, that that is on you. You have a, a you have multiple employees under your under your direction in the communications team that we have. And I think a clear message, clear direction, and clear job scope of who does what when. And this needs to be seven days a week, people. This, this, if you're gonna put out messaging, it needs to go out on the weekends too because that's when events happen. Okay. All right. 
Well, let me go to the commission. I ask you to make any final comments. Dave, start with you, please. Yeah, I, I just want to emphasize, I think, a trade school, especially with the programs we have coming out of it. I know Pine Ridge's programs, and I think something locally would be really beneficial, really something strong for us to uh, look at. Uh, communication, uh, going to what the mayor just said, getting it out there, um, but getting it out there in a timely manner. I just got my water bill on, on uh, I thought, what was it, Friday, and I got the newsletter, but all the events in it had already expired back in <laughs> April. So, so we, we, we need to do a better job okay. at getting things out there ahead of yeah, time and not a month after they've passed. I, okay. You know, I, I think that's where we've Good. we've not done as well that we really need to is communicate events that are happening. Um, I know uh, in the last month or so, I've seen a lot of social media events, advertising, you know, the workshops here, the code enforcement workshops, but still a lot of people don't see them. So we need to look at other avenues other than the city website. Right and social media, because a lot of people don't do social media. Trust me, if it wasn't for my business, I probably wouldn't do it. Yeah. Yeah. Let, me, let me ask a question. Um, is there a consensus that you all would like to see a different process on how we get the newsletter out? Such as direct mailing them instead of putting them in the water bill. Here's, here's the problem. How many people get that newsletter? How many people are in Deltona Water? Well, if we put them in the water bill, 36,000. How many residents are in Deltona? How many households? Sorry. Well, households. We, we cover all but 6,000 households with the water bill. Okay. Because I, I know personally, I'm not on Deltona Water. Well, you're, on, so I don't you're get, in Del North. And so I'm on Del North County, which means pretty much three quarters of my district is not going to even see your newsletter. And it, it's been brought up. I didn't know this was going on. There's no idea that. It's expired. <laughs> Listen, I, I could have gone with that. The reason, the reason I asked the question is um, I think the best methodology is direct mailing. And I think it would be, you know, as large as we are, it should be monthly. So the reason I'm asking is I need to put money in the budget for it. That would be an um, EDDM? You're, you're saying EDDM and every door direct mail? So we didn't need to almost bid that out to... We used to do that. It used to be monthly, and then it was it went down the water bill because everybody wanted to save money. They didn't want to spend the money but, on it. But that, yeah, you know, the, that's what as, it comes down as, to. As that's we what it always comes down to money. Yeah. Well, cathedral cathedral printing, we can actually send it to them. They will mail it out, and it is a cheaper rate. That was one of the beauties of doing the cathedral printing. Right contract, if we have the ability to do a separate mailer um, with all the city residents in it, and um, we can price it out in terms of what it would cost monthly to do it, um, we would have to get to Del North mailing addresses and in the database, but, um, you know, it's the most efficient way to get the information out. Uh, it just costs money, and, uh, you know, the commission's amenable, we'll go ahead and inserted into the budget. Maritza, your final comments today. No, no, I, oh, I'm well, sorry. Going back to the direct mail, I mean, I think if we had the newsletter within the water bill that's going to, you know, 30,000 residents, let's say 6,000 don't get it, I think that is a good tool. However, we need to have a, a current calendar yeah. in there, not one that's expired. I think that's the key thing. Okay. And then as far as direct mail, if you're already sending it in the water bill, why would you send it again a second time? I mean, if you're looking at doing it monthly, even at 40 cents a, a piece, you're looking probably about 15 to 20,000 a month. You know, do we really want to add that in the budget when we're already spending that money sending it in the water bill? I mean, well, I, I think we could piggyback on those. Well, let me ask this, generally, not, you not to try to resolve that today, but that's part of what I asked John to bring back to you in the budget proposal, some alternatives once you All actually right. see the budget. Yeah, there was a, part of the problem with the water bills is every June we have to do, every June, July, we have to do our water quality report. That's the one add-on. Then in the fall, we typically have to do any rate adjustments. There's like three of them a year 
that we could not do a newsletter in the water bill. Uh, so that's one of the disadvantages. One, the biggest advantage to me is everybody got to open the water bill, so they're going to see the newsletter. <laughs> but, so but, as the mayor indicated, you know, I got to do some internal work with regard to the whole communication process in the city. Marisa? Thank you. So, um, you know, what Mr. Peter read down his line, um, it's, you know, what I agree that we should sit down and, and, and work with him on. And I also want to say that, you know, we, we are elected commissioners, but I don't think our work stops here. Uh, we need to get involved. So one of the things that came up, as soon as we took a break, you know, um, David came over to me and said, how do we bring up all that stuff that you mentioned, all those events? And I said, well, unfortunately, we cannot work on it because of the Sunshine State, but, you know, we can probably work with a department to help them. And one of the, um, one of the things that the state has done is that, especially with the affordable housing, is that they have to have an elected official as a member of their board. And I think they're gonna do that with other um, boards that are uh, sponsored by the state. So maybe we can um, adopt that process. So, it, you know, parks and recs, you know, we need somebody to work with parks and recs to bring all these things back, you know. Um, we need somebody to work on uh, with the water department to help them do that, uh, you know, on the elected officials uh, side to volunteer with them. When we were having the problems, you know, we were getting backed up with phone calls. We all volunteer to show up and make phone calls, but then we were told, but what are you going to say? Because you don't have the experience of the water department. But those are some of the things um, that I appreciate you coming in and, and asking and offering to help bring it back, um, but we'll, you know, we'll cover that with Mr. Peters. The other thing I want to say is about the center. You know, nobody wanted it, but it's here, right? Um, so I think that we need to continue promoting it. As Joe said before he left, right now, even up to the month of September, he's booked completely. So, you know, we need to start promoting it more because it is picking up, it has picked up. And I can tell you from experience that people that I sent there come from other areas because they're being charged too much. And Joe has a way of coming up with a plan or with a program that nobody walks out of the center dissatisfied with a price that he puts together affordable for them. So, you know, we just got to keep promoting the center and making it work what it is right now. Right. Lauren, final comments. I think everything that we've talked about has been very important. Um, uh, I'm, I'm looking forward to, um, to seeing the plan mm -hmm. uh, and, and moving forward with what we've spoken about. Um, I think that uh, just my last couple of comments, uh, you can take them however you want. Uh, <laughs> one is on messaging. Uh, we have a lot of ways to communicate in the city. Um, I think we need to use all of them. Um, we, we may have to come up with some change in policy as to uh, what can go on our message signs that we've got all over the city now. Every entrance has a message sign. Our parks have a message sign. A lot of them have message signs. Um, we spend a lot of money on those signs. And as I mentioned uh, to Mr. Peters uh, yesterday, uh, already uh, the one over on LCAM is not working. So that one's just a black screen. Uh, and um, he said he's going to take care of that uh, as soon as he can, um, but the way I hear, and you guys can correct me again if I'm wrong, the stuff that goes on the sign has to be stuff that's city sponsored or city um, directed. I think maybe that should change a little bit because we do have a lot of things going on in the city that could be advertised on those signs that would be one other way 
to get information out to the public. Um, you know, the American Legion is going to take part with VSEP uh, for Memorial Day, and we're going to do a ceremony at the park uh, to be able to put that on that sign um, about now because we're all getting close. Um, two weeks away would be great to be able to have that information on there. Um, so uh, there's other, other groups that may have an event coming up, and that would be a great way to do it. Um, so I think we should look at that and see whether there is some way that people can uh, make a submission or an application to the city uh, to, to get something on those signs. I mean, I know it might take somebody doing some work in, in City Hall, somebody on staff, probably have to look at that. Um, I know we have people in IT and, and uh, public relations that are involved already um, that I'm sure would, would be able to help with that. Um, and then I don't want to be negative, but I want to put this out and I want us as, as a group to drive by and just take a look and see whether or not maybe you will agree with me. I was up at Hallam Boulevard um, and Graves yesterday and day before passing through there several times. And we now have this massive, two massive uh, signs up there. Um, they say Halifax Hospital or Halifax Health, Health U U U UF. Man, are they big. But the city of Deltona advertises on that sign. Did you know that? Our city, logo is, Our city logo is on that sign, but it's on the end of the sign. So if you don't look quickly enough, you don't even see that. Um, and, and the same thing on the sign on the other side of the, of the street. They're not coming into the city of Halifax Health UM, <laughs> uh, UF, they're coming into Deltona. And, and I get it, it's going down that road, but it's right there at that huge intersection where everyone passes by practically. Um, I think we should try and talk to uh, Halifax about maybe putting that logo, either another one or moving the logo that's on the end of the signs that nobody see. To the, to the front of the sign on, on, the, on the tower part so that they actually see the city logo. So it's I mean, more of an entryway feature. Yeah, it's, 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 an, it's like an entryway. They will put it up there because it was an entry to the city and it's also an entry to uh, the hospital area. Can but, I say something on that? Um, okay. But I'd, I'd like to, maybe we can just talk about that at some point. I'm, I will follow up with the developer. That's probably the development agreement, and I will yeah. follow up on it. Well, okay, and for me, uh, I, I, I want to get you all out on time. I don't, without your permission, I don't want to keep you over. So, Victor, go ahead, please. No, I'm just going to jump on that. Yes, your valid point is not our entryway, but we should have something for an entryway aside of what Halifax is doing to go to into their entryway. And another form is we have banners. We have Elkham and Deltona Boulevard that for whatever reason, it's been almost a year now, and there has not been a banner up there for whatnot. We invested some money on those poles out there to be out there. I'm not sure why we're not using them, but that's will, just another thing. I will thing. address that. Um, it appears that the banners that we have used in the past have been on poles that we do not have control over. Interesting. It was a case that we put it up there and asked for forgiveness after the fact. So I have instructed wow. our public works department to go through the process of buying our own poles so that we can put so we invested damnable banners up properly. Okay. Yes. I won't, go any, I won't go into that. As far as today, <laughs> as far as today, I, I think um, Mr. Peters talked about communication that we talked about communication in-house. Uh, I, I want to say communication with us, which is what we can control. I think um, during the break, there was a comment made and, and they said, you know, I don't want to create more work for ourselves, and this is staff, but I think this has been a great opportunity on how you guys have spoken. 
Um, and I addressed it, well, that's why we have commission and workshops. And I think if, if we just can take this demeanor, for whatever reason, just take it up there, um, we can be successful. We have disagreed here, believe it or not, but no one has gone at anyone, and I think we're trying to find solutions. Um, and in that aspect of it, it's about respecting the process. I think if, if we show that we respect the process, everyone else then will show that they respect the process. I enjoy working with every single one of you. I just think we have to do a better job in communicating with each other and respecting each other. Thank you. Thank you. Anita? <laughs> and, and, and I will say, I mean, you're right. I, I totally agree. But a couple things that were brought up that are on my list have been brought up, which I appreciate. Um, can we work on getting signs in something at that exit? Because as you know, I don't have a sign. I don't. Let me rephrase this. I need to take that out of my vocabulary. 472 does not have any sign. We don't have a flashing sign. We don't have a welcome sign. We have absolutely nothing that's entering to it. So it was removed when, yes, it, it was removed when Wawa went in because of the widening and there is another developer there. I don't have at any area there, Deltona High has their sign, but the sign that we had there by Wawa is gone. So there is no welcome sign there. Uh-uh, yeah, there is nothing. And I believe in the past, huh? On racetrack, not by Wawa. There was a it was across from racetrack, right. But what happened is when Wawa was doing their development, because they did that turn lane, it's in the sidewalk, it disappeared. So there is nothing. And I have a feeling that Halifax would be willing only because a prior city manager had showed me an original drawing that Halifax did and Tony's nodding her head, Jess. That sign originally came up, way up over the road, came across and down and connected, and at the top it said, welcome to Deltona, and she didn't like it, and never was presented to us. So I have a feeling there is room that we can do it, um, because I think that would be just like monumental for Deltona to have that, especially if we are going to be going into that industrial. But that's something that, I mean, it's been a year and a half now at this point, that's something when we do, these are important things to me, is branding the city. Um, do we need to look at, I think, again, somebody else had put in, you know, our, our little logo that says a city on the move. Well, what does a city on the move mean? And to me, that's part of a branding that how, what do we want that branding to say? So to me, branding is very, very important, um, is the outreach, the communication, the education, the gallery and the framing. To me, those are the most important aspects that we have covered. And I don't want it just to be like, okay, it's dropped and we're, and we're done. And this is like a session that we should honestly be doing, I don't know if we can do it quarterly, but twice a year when we need to sit down and we need to hash this out. And I st stopped myself from saying my district because a lot of times what happens is, you know, I've had a lot of people approach me and say, hey, blah, 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 blah. Well, but I know you're not my commissioner, so I really should. Listen, I may not be a commissioner in your district, but we all vote and make decisions together. So if there's something concerning you and there's something bothering you, we are all commissioners working together, and it shouldn't be something that we can't say, you know what, I appreciate that. I'm gonna forward it on to Mr. Peters, who can maybe let you know your commissioner know, or here's your commissioner, reach out to that commissioner. But I don't not care because it's not my district. I do care. And, you know, I don't see everything going on in district to write at that entrance as, oh, it's Commissioner Bradford's district. That's not Commissioner Bradford's district. That's our district. That's all of us. And so what happens there impacts every single one of you guys and the city and the residents. It's very big. So I just, I just had to get that off my chest because that's been something that's been bugging me. If but I can address that real quick. Yeah. Um, I will follow up on what happened to one at Wawa, but I will also tell you that um, in playing around with the sign for the center, um, I had a, a grand design and was told that it exceeded our sign requirements, and that's part of the reason these other message boards are so small. 
Um, you know, many of these message boards on roads that was 40, 45 mile an hour speed limit, and you really can't read them. And that's because our sign ordinance creates too small of a message board. So, you know, one of the things we need to do is revisit with particularity to match city message board for the purposes of putting out messages so that we can have a proper size sign because there's an old rule of thumb, I think it's one inch for every 10 miles an hour you're going down the road. So if, if it's 40 miles an hour on Howland, then the letters should be, no, actually two inches, the letters should be eight inches tall. Well, you know, try to put in city of Deltona eight inches tall, and you got a message board that's 50 inches, but we're only allowed 48. So, you know, you already, you know, you can't put enough of a message on there to read it. So review of your um, sign ordinance might be under mm -hmm. order. A review so, of the sign ordinance. So, you know, we need, we need to revisit mm -hmm. the sign order, like I said, with particularity to our city message board for the purpose of giving information to the public. Okay. And, and not I get for advertising a facility. So, so here's, here's my question is, and, and I don't have this answer, but that's why I'm asking this question. Uh, I'm gonna throw Deland out there and Mount Dora. De those two cities are continually having events and those events are packed. So how do they get the message out? How are they getting the information out? Because you'll know ahead of time Oh my gosh, Delian's got this event going on, Mount Dora's got this event going on. How are they getting the message out to the residents and getting them to the events? Is it, you know, and, I, and I'll be honest, I think I've walked into the land a few times and you'll see little cards or brochures or something, even at the local businesses that people can pick up and take that says, hey, the weekend of blah, 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 they've got the Black Festival going on. So uh, I, will, I will share this with you. Um, having been employed in one of those cities you mentioned. Right. Um, the um, events manager for Mount Dora, uh, his significant other is a uh, uh, radio personality and one of the heart, I heart radios. So between the two of them, they get the messages out through I heart radio. Um, uh, the city doesn't pay it. Um, they have Visit Mount Dora Incorporated, which is a privately owned company that they use but be a contract. They are um, a good company. Um, they're, in, they're in charge with, of just about all the events. Um, and in fact, they handle um, farmers markets in the Barry, Longwood, and uh, Mount Dora. All three are pretty successful. Uh, they get the messages out on those. Um, the events in Mount Dora, they don't worry about getting the messages out to the locals. They want the people from outside the area, and that's why the advertisement on iHeartRadio is critical, uh, because they're reaching the whole Orlando market. Um, let's face it, um, Mount Dora is a charming little New England style town, uh, especially in the downtown area. People like to go there. You, know, you feel like you're walking the mountains and whatever. Um, it's a popular destination. The events are popular. As I have indicated to you all before when we were talking about uh, having you know, uh, designated city events, what Mount Dora does is if you've had the event for seven years straight, you become a designated event, then the city will sponsor. And the city will sponsor it at that point. So I've already talked to you about a process similar to what Mount Dora does. Um, I think the, um, the Blueberry Festival just went to city sponsored status. Um, but, you know, they have a, a group that handles it. Uh, for the city. The city effort is basically one person, but they also have a program where employees volunteer to work the weekend. Uh, they don't get overtime, they get a flat rate. I've yet to figure out how they legally do that. We can get a labor attorney to help us with that. But the employees take a great deal of pride in it. 
Um, you know, they take pride in the fact that they get cleaned up the morning after. It, you wouldn't know they had the art festival. Um, so it's a process. Um, I'd be happy to reach out to the people that do that. Um, I was going to reach out to them about the possibility of doing a farmer's market here because, like I said, they've been very successful in DeBerry and Mount Dora and Longwood with that. And in fact, in Longwood, at Ryder Park, the same people are doing events at Ryder Park now. Um, so. And, and I know as well in Mount Dora, they also hand out, somebody goes around on, what's it called, Seg Segway? And they're literally going into each good. each and every building, and they're handing them a flyer about a week or two in advance, saying, um, "This is an event that's taking place in two weeks, and this is what you can and cannot do." So it's kind of they're putting flyers in each business for them to hand out as well. Right, but I will tell you, the entire event program in Mount Dort is a very um, elaborate, very well orchestrated process, having been through it. Uh, we know where the barricades go. We know where everything goes, no matter the event. I think there's like three different barricade plans based on the size of the event. And um, so, yeah, it's a, a well-oiled machine over there. Significant budget, practice. I'm sure. Mm -hmm. But so what we'll do is in the strategic plan to look at the review best practices for doing that. Which is yeah, and I think that's important life. because holding events isn't anything that the community is not aware of it and not sure. involved. Yeah. So it's, it's quite important to have them there. Um, and that's, I think you all have pretty much nailed it. So thank you again for thank you. you staff and residents for being a part of this. Before I go to the mayor, uh, I will see you again on Monday the 23rd. We'll have a draft of the plan. Uh, it'll take John and I till Wednesday or so next week, so you're not going to get a lot of time, Rita, and I just apologize, but we're under a clock here. so. We'll get it to you quick as we can. Heidi, if you'll wrap up for us. I please. will wrap up very quickly. Most everyone touched on what I had written down. The main thing that we have to talk about when we talk about communication is the messaging should be consistent. The signs, the web page, social media, email, banners, we have all the things in place. We just have to have a consistent, consistent message. The other thing that was talked about was the gateways, the gateways to our community. We have three I-4 interchanges. I'm a very visual person, as a lot of people are. Your first impression when you come into the city is a lasting impression. It's a lasting impression, and that is something that we have to focus on. Howland Boulevard, 472, is a great first impression. You come up there, you see the vibrancy, you see construction, you see everything else. The other two exits, not so much. We've heard the excuse over and over again <clears throat> that it's beyond I-4 Ultimate might be coming and so forth. I understand that you don't want to do a lot, but there have to be some things that the city can do, whether we use some money from our tree funds, whether we just concentrate on landscaping and we concentrate on doing something, a sign, something that's movable, that, that, that'll give us a direct visual impact for our gateways and also down on, on the Doyle Road area. You know, when you come in there, that's not, to me, not as bad. The worst two exits are Doyle and Saxon, that, that image when you come into the city. And the other thing um, that I wanted to say is, as we, as, as, as elected officials, we're elected officials, we set policy, we do all that. But a big thing that we do that I didn't hear talked about today was that we are ambassadors. We are ambassadors of our city. And we are reflective of our city. And... We have to realize as ambassadors, we're ambassadors as of the city as a whole, but we're also ambassadors of our district. Every district is different. Embrace that diversity. Your district is pretty much built out. Looking at, looking at a lot of the things, your district three is a district that has to revitalize itself and change. To a degree, district four is like that. District one, you have an older section, but you also have an area that, that's up and coming. District two, district six, everyone is different. But be amb an ambassador for your district. Learn about your parks in your district. Learn about your events in your district to promote that. And we have to, again, find a unified voice because we all are ambassadors and we should be putting the best foot forward for the city of Daltona wherever we go. Get on boards. Get on boards of local nonprofits. Get on boards like the Boys and Girls Club, like Healthy Start. Get on boards of the Florida League of Cities. 
look at, participate in those things and understand that the issues we have here, you, you do this all over the state. Mm -hmm. How unique are we? Everybody's very unique and distinctive, but everybody has the same issues. That's what I mean. That's what I mean, issue-wise. The issues are, are not only relative to Daltona, and I think sometimes it helps us from an emotional standpoint when we deal with that to realize that we are not the only ones that have to deal with these issues. So I want to thank you very much. And the last thing that I want to say is sometimes some questions and some issues have no viable current solution. And I think that's something that we have to accept as well. That sometimes there's no right answer for something. There's not an answer that you can give that's a viable answer at this point. We can't say when I-4 Ultimate is gonna come. We can't say if it's gonna come. We can't say that we are going to be able to, you know, bring in a certain type of business right now. We might, but we can't promise, but we can't say no. And sometimes to understand that sometimes there is no viable solution or correct answer at this time is an answer in itself with an explanation. And that all comes back to communication. Thank you so much. Thank you all very much. Appreciate the time, Dave.